Is that what you're saying, sir? I'm here. So good day one and all. It is once again my privilege to welcome one and all to this uh, yet another fantastic session on behalf of the Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons of India, Tamil Nadu and Puducherry chapter and Craniofacial Academy of Stryker. I welcome each one of you to this session on aesthetic surgery of the face. Looking forward to a great session with a great panel talking to us on aesthetic surgery of the face. We've had, this is the se second webinar of this month. We've had a great session last time on non-surgical cosmetic procedures of the face. So here again, we are on a learning session on aesthetic surgery of the face. Over to you, Dr. Jimson. Thank you, ma'am, for the introduction. Now, uh, I invite uh, Dr. Suresh to introduce the moderator and the panelists. Thank you, Jimson. Uh, a yeah, very good afternoon to everyone. And uh, I should personally thank uh, Professor Dr. Reena John and uh, Dr. Jimson for the tireless effects to bring these webinars mm -hmm. a possibility. So I'll take the privilege of introducing the moderator and the panelists for the day. Dr. Sainath Matsa is going to be the moderator for today's session. He's a very good friend of mine, and I feel he's the right person to be the moderator from our part of the world today. We are so proud to have Dr. Sainath Matsa as the moderator because he has always focused on facial aesthetic surgeries and hair transplantation surgeries during um, post his MDS career throughout. So he has got an extensive knowledge on this. So he'll be the right person to moderate today's session. He yes. has undergone training in cleft and craniofacial deformities as well. And uh, in 3D navigation surgery at Frankfurt, Germany in 2008. He has completed his fellowship in hair transplant surgery from Hair Science Center at Colorado, USA. Also, he has undergone training at Darling Buds, Chandigarh in 2013. He has finished his clinical fellow in cosmetic surgery under Professor Dr. V. Ilankovan from the UK. He has published several scientific articles. He has contributed mm -hmm. few chapters in the textbooks too. He is associated with many Indian and international associations for oral and maxillofacial surgery, hair restoration surgeons, cleft, cleft lip and palate surgeries. We welcome you, Dr. Sainath, for moderating the show. Thank and we are so waiting much. to learn from you. Panelists are going to be number one, Dr. Daryl Michael Coombs. Dr. Coombs has completed his dentistry from King's College London from 1989 to 1993 and medicine from 96 to 2000 in the same institution. He has become a member of Royal College of Surgeons Edinburgh in 2003. He has also completed the fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons, that is FRCS and Intercollegiate Board in Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. During his study tenure, he has won several prizes and honors like Faculty Fellowship Prize, Gold Medal in FRCS, Glaxo Dermatology Prize, Knight of the Order of St. John Malta. After working as Senior House Officer and Registrar in various hospitals, he possessed the consultant post in oral and maxillofacial surgery at Queen Victoria Hospital for a long time, that is, uh, from 2008 to 2018. Apart from the common oral and maxillofacial surgeries, he has an extensive knowledge and experience on skin scan, cancer management and facial aesthetic surgeries. He possesses a, very, a vast teaching experience and has published several articles in scientific journals. He has authored and co-authored many textbooks too, to his credit. We are so honored to have Dr. Coombe with us today. Welcome, Dr. Daryl Coombe. 
Thank you very much for your invite. It's a, a great honour to speak and um, I'm hoping I can uh, give a good contribution today. Thank you very much for the invite. Thank you. Then uh, our own Dr. David Taro, Professor Do Dr. David Taro. Dr. Taro is known as the trendsetter in the field of cranium maxillofacial surgery in India. He has more than 30 years of experience in this field. He has completed his BDS and MDS from India and then he joined the Plastic and Maxillofacial Surgery Unit at St. Lawrence Hospital, South Wales, United Kingdom. He then came back to India and was trained by very popular cosmetic surgeons in Karnataka. He had a very long association with Professor Paul Salins, an internationally popular craniofacial surgeon. He had worked as faculty at various institutions at Karnataka, India. He had held the chairman post at Cranium Maxillofacial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Unit at Bapuji Dental College and College of Dental Surgery at Davangere. He is a consultant to a consultant facial plastic surgeon to many renowned hospitals in and around Bangalore, Karnataka, India. Dr. Taro is the managing director and chief consultant of the Tollins Clinic, a Cranium Maxillofacial Surgery Center which is very popular at Bangalore, India. He has a numerous scientific publications on craniofacial surgeries. He has delivered more than 200 keynote lectures so far on facial plastic surgery on various national and international platforms. He held the prestigious post of the president of AOMSI and president of Indian Society of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Surgeons last year. It is a privilege and honor to have you here today, sir. Thank you very much for your valuable time with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suresh. Thank you very much. It's and, a pleasure. Uh, yeah. Pleasure, sir. Dr. Sridhar Reddy, another panelist here with us today. Uh, he is an experienced facial aesthetic surgeon and hair transplant surgeon. He had completed his BDS from Bapuji Dental College, Davangere, Karnataka, in 2002 and MDS from COTS, College of Dental Surgery, Davangere, in 2006. He has more than 13 years of experience in the field of maxillofacial surgeries and hair transplant surgeries. He had been a resident at Kidwai Cancer Institute too. He has worked as a faculty in Yogita Dental College and Saraswati Dhanvantri Dental College. He is a consultant at some of the reputed hospitals at Bangalore. Currently, he is the clinical director and chief operating surgeon at Pioneer Advanced Hair Transplant Center, Bangalore. He is probably the first maxillofacial surgeon in India to start the hair transplant surgeries. Till now, he has performed about 4,300 hair transplant surgeries. That's a huge number. He is a specialist in performing combination technique in hair, hair transplants using hybrid techniques. He has published several articles on hair transplant surgeries, orthognathic surgeries, and implants. He stands very distinct as a great human being too, because he has done, he is very keen on doing social service apart from maxillofacial surgery. He has constructed mineral water projects which supply RO water to about 50 villages in Andhra Pradesh free of cost. He has made arrangements to vaccinate the poor school children with hepatitis B vaccine free of cost to the school children. So we welcome you Dr. Uh, Sridhar Reddy. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thanks, thanks for this, getting this opportunity with my teacher, lovely teacher, David Taro. And thanks to Sainat. Thanks to everyone. One and all. Thank you so much. Thank over to you, Dr. Jimson. Please take over. Thank you, Suresh. And uh, <laughs> uh, Sai, it's all yours. The stage is yours. Yes. Good evening, everyone. So we're going to start with the session. <clears throat> Can you see my screen, sir? Yes, sir, yes, I know. Yes, yes. So first of all, very good afternoon. And uh, I thank uh, the organizing team, secretary, and the president of our esteemed association for inviting me as a moderator. And we have such a great panelist uh, uh, talking about uh, facial aesthetic, uh, especially on rhinoplasty uh, by Dr. David Toro. 
um, uh, blepharoplasty, skin and uh, I mean, uh, neck and face lift by Dr. Daryl Coombs and uh, hair transplant surgery of the scalp by Dr. Sridhar Reddy. So that's why I made it as like aesthetic surgery of head and face because it, this is going to uh, complete even the scalp uh, transplant. So it's a super specialization in the field of plastic and maxillofacial surgery. And I call it as an art, science, craft and skill in the surgical field, which is designed to improve and enhance the appearance of the face by reshaping, repositioning or tightening the skin, fat, muscle uh, to have balance in the proportion. So it's not just the skin which is going to uh, be corrected. The underlying the fats the muscle uh, and the bony architecture has to be uh, corrected in uh, aesthetic surgery. And uh, I don't want to talk too much of the history as most of them know uh, that uh, how it started with uh, rhinoplasty and then, you know, saddle nose corrections of uh, syphilis. And um, in 1920s, the first modern rhinoplasty started to 2000 with, uh, you know, uh, the surgeries have come very less and most of them are using uh, non-surgical work uh, for the aesthetic uh, procedures. So we are going to talk today especially on cosmetic surgical rhinoplasties and surgical brophoplasty. Um, I hope it's, it's gonna be both upper lid and the eye, uh, lower eyelid. Uh, then face, face and neck lift surgeries and, and, and last uh, about the hair transplant surgery. Mm -hmm. yeah. So first we will start with uh, Dr. David Toro uh, with, um, uh, by, I mean, uh, with co cosmetic rhinoplasty. Sir, could you take it up please? Um, okay. Hold on, Sai. Uh, I seem to be having a problem. My presentation is closed down and I can't locate it. One moment. Sai, you need to stop your screen share. Yeah. Uh, Sai, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. I, I seem to be having a problem opening this now. Um, okay, should I start I with think the... In the meanwhile, could you ask uh, Daryl to start off? Yeah. I will just try to this find should be, it. That should be a problem. Uh, uh, sorry for this. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the attendees for the... Uh, the I, I'll ask Dr. Daryl Coombs to start with his presentation first on blepharoplasty, face lift, and neck lift. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. No problem, sir, please. <clears throat> Can everybody see my screen clearly? Yes. 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 Can you hear me as well? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invite. It's a real honor um, to be contacted. Uh, by Asanath and uh, I'm, I'm really honoured to talk to you and hopefully I can impart some knowledge about my experience about how I undertake surgical rejuvenation of the, the face, neck and the eyelids. Um, just going to change something here. Um, the aims of this presentation basically are to basically when you're undertaking cosmetic surgery you need to keep in your mind why are you doing it you know and you need to think about beauty because a lot of surgeons in my country particularly they undertake this stuff uh, aimlessly they just think oh I just want to get a good result but what is a good result what is what is beauty beauty is really an aggregate or the qualities in a person that give pleasures particularly to the senses the eye senses the visual senses but in the UK um, we always think uh, beauty, well, in my eyes, is especially a woman. And that, that's what I need to keep in my mind when I'm, I'm undertaking such surgery. Just some quotes here um, about what beauty can be defined as. Um, some of you have probably heard these quotes before. You may or may not know who actually quoted them. This one I'm going to 
centre on in a minute. I think this is really interesting because it shows that Bridget Bardot, the famous Frank, French actress, she kind of accepts that she's got old as a woman and she's now given up on her beauty and now she's using her wisdom to, uh, for animal rights, particularly in France and the world. This is interesting. One of my old bosses gave me this slide many years ago and said, this is really what you should be looking for in the perfect woman. I'm not so sure she's as good looking as the sum of her parts, but these are the things we're trying to get facial harmony and balance. So when we're undertaking cosmetic surgery, we have to think, what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to correct things that don't look quite right anatomically. And we're also trying to reverse age changes. This is a big thing in the United Kingdom at the moment. People seem to hate aging. They're really trying to stop it. And during this COVID-19 lockdown, I've never seen so many women asking for blepharoplasties and facelifts and rhinoplasties. It's incredible. Just to show you a, a, an elderly lady's face, what can happen here. You've got uh, the orbital septum weakens, you get these big fat pads and it's, it's asymmetrical. Beauty is symmetry. Her face is asymmetrical. Her face has dropped as well and the skin has become thickened. These are all things that we try to reverse when we're undertaking cosmetic surgery. The other thing that's really important before you even embark on surgery with anybody is to meet your patient's expectations. This is a lady in Cuba. If this lady came to me asking for a facelift or a neck lift, I wouldn't expect her to look like this at the end. So you really need to, uh, I wouldn't even operate on this lady actually in fairness, but you can't really change someone to someone, you can't move them up the ladder say about 10 or 20 steps. You can only slightly change them. So in terms of the face and neck, even in the UK, um, we now have males asking for facelifts and neck lifts. Um, you can see this gradual onward onslaught of aging um, with the wrinkles in the face, descending facial features, the hair loss, which will be discussed later on. These are all things that are concerning the populations of today worldwide. So as I mentioned earlier, Bridget Bardot, I gave my beauty and my youth to men. I'm going to give my wisdom and experience to animals. You can see how beautiful she was in, in the heydays of the 60s. And now she's aged. She's got these ritids, these wrinkles. Her face is squared off. She's got platysmal banding. She's got wrinkles around her eyes. There's been some brow descent, but she's accepted the fact that she's aged. She's not trying to do anything. And as far as I know, Bridget Bardu, I think is now in her late 80s, 90, early 90s, she's <clears throat> embraced aging and some people do that. But when we look at an aged face, we have to look at all these issues. What causes them? What what's caused this lady to transform from this seemingly beautiful woman to a woman of age and wisdom? And these are the things that you're gonna try and address when you're undertaking surgery for facial aging. And you need to keep these in mind, they're very important. When you look at uh, someone's face, when you look at a youthful lady, they have, um, they call this the sort of triangle almost, the, uh, the rising face, you know, it's got lovely facial features. You've got this broad width of the zygomatic bones, the cheekbones comes in nicely to a pointy chin and this, in the, the, the eyes of the beholder, if you like, is what beauty looks like. However, as we age, the sun sets and you get the inversion of this, uh, this shape here. You get the squared off jaw appearance. And this is what a lot of women who come to see me for facelift surgery, this is their problem. They say, I don't like my squared off jaw. I don't like my jowls. Everything is descending due to gravity and loss of soft tissue support. Similarly with the neck, we all know the platysma is one of the muscles of facial expression mm -hmm. and all those years of moving that muscle, it loses its tonicity and its integrity. And there are actually variants of how this muscle becomes less uh, integral, if you like. It sort of opens in the middle and it lets fat drop down in the neck. It also lets the submandibular gans drop down and this doesn't look very aesthetic at all. So, these two ladies, I, I, I was asked to talk about a case presentation for each topic, but I think with facelift surgery, you have to tailor make your surgery. You can't 
just do one procedure for everybody's face. It's a very personal thing. And as Sainath said, this is where art meets surgery or meets science. So the lady on the left, she's very unhappy with her, her mm. jowls. Um, she's, this lady here is in her late 60s. This lady is in her early 50s. You can see there is a, a difference with uh, the, the aging process. This lady is obviously further along the line. So you can't do the same operation that this lady would want. It, it just doesn't work. This lady disliked her saggy neck and her lower face. She called these areas around her marionette lines. She called these her crinkles. And she said, I hate my crispy neck. It's creased and she hated it. And she was clearly not very happy. I had actually done her upper blepharoplasty. So her eyes actually look quite youthful. She's got these tarsal show, which looks good. She had tried fillers with no success but was mm. clearly very unhappy. So to, in order to um, sort this lady out, one needs to undertake a deep plane lift to lift up the SMAS. And I'll talk about the SMAS layer in a minute to suspend her face and also to address the, pl the platysma muscle, which has caused this banding in her neck. So you really need to pull all this back and fix it. So in terms of the surgical approach, she needs a full deep plane face fit facelift, sub SMAS, underneath the SMAS layer, the superficial muscular aponeurotic system, which sits just underneath the skin. And in terms of the incision, you go along the hairline into the folds mm -hmm. in the ear, preauricular, and also go backwards as well, just into the hair. So you can dissect broadly. And here we can see, this is another patient of mine. I'm sorry about the quality of the photograph, but I'd make a very, very, um, small well large incision here actually goes around right round behind the ear this is your classic ritidectomy incision scar basically and you go make a nice skin flap with facelift scissors or some people use a knife i use a knife to get to about here then i finish it up with facelift incisors and come right up to the nasolabial mm -hmm. groove Remember this lady wants her neck addressed as well so i make an incision just in the submental area I have to say, as I'm doing more and more neck lift surgery, I've moved my incision more inferior on the neck, just above the cricoid cartilage now, so I can really access this platysma muscle. And then what I do, once I've done the skin flaps, you can see the scissors, the, the face lift scissors are actually gone through that anterior incision. So you're actually completely degloving the skin around the neck and the lower third of the face and the upper two thirds, well, the upper third of the face, if you like. Skin flap, as I say, is elevated, has to be meticulous hemostasis. You should transilluminate it to make sure that your skin flap is completely even. Because if you don't, if you have little bits of fat attached to it, when you lift the skin flap back into its new position, you'll have a patient who's complaining of a lumpy face and then you have to live with that patient for the rest of your life. So you must try and get this nice and even, nice and thin. Not too thin, if, because what will happen in some places, if you put too much tension on the skin, you'll get skin necrosis. And the other thing to um, state at this point is that you must avoid patients who cigarette smoke or even cigar smoke if they're from Cuba, but cigarette smoking is a bad thing as is vaping. Vaping is a big thing in the UK at the moment where people who are trying to give up cigarette smoking, vaping can compromise this vascular arcade in the subdermal plexus of the skin flap and you can get skin necrosis. So if a patient wants a facelift and they tell you, oh, by the way, doctor, I smoke, don't do the facelift because you will run into problems no matter how much money they offer you, don't do it. And as stated, when you're raising your skin flap, you, I use a, uh, an adrenaline uh, local anesthetic mix to help with hemostasis, but you obviously must use cautery to ensure that all of this bed and the skin flap is completely dry. We don't want any bleeding or any hematomas, and you must take your time when you raise the skin flap. It's not a race, take your time. Once you've raised the skin flap, you get to this area on the face, 
the SMAS, the superficial muscular apneurotic system. Now, this was uh, debated in the 60s and 70s. Some anatomists even uh, stated that it didn't exist. Well, to facelift surgeons like myself, it does exist because it's my bread and butter. It's my basis that I use to facelift on. The other thing to know is that it, it's superficial to the facial nerve, which is really important. If you're above the SMAS layer, you're safe. The SMAS layer is really contiguous with the platysma muscle and running through the SMAS and through the rest of the face are these re retinacular retaining ligaments. You can just see them here. And when you're, you're dissecting the, the SMAS from the face, you need to think about where these ligaments are. There are some strong ligaments. There's one in the uh, zygomatic area and there's one at the mandibular angle. These are the two main ligaments that you really need to carefully divide if you're to mobilize this SMAS flap that you develop, and I'll show you how that develops. Unfortunately for us, the facial nerve branches, particularly the zygomatic branch and the buccal branches run with these ligaments. So you have to be exceedingly careful and identify those facial branches when you're dissecting in the sub-SMAS area. So where can you find the SMAS? Well, you should really start off at the posterior border of the platysma muscle. And those of you who remember your anatomy, the platysma muscle is just anterior. It kind of forms a confluation, if you like, with the sternocleidomastoid muscle. If you find the great auricular nerve, and those of you who do proctodectomies will know what that nerve looks like. If you go about a centimeter or a centimeter and a half, and then make an incision just anterior to the great auricular nerve, you can then develop your sub platysmal flap, because you need, if you're going to address this lady's neck who's complaining of um, platysmal banding, you need to get underneath this muscle and you need to create a tunnel. Another area that's really important when you're undertaking uh, facelifting surgery is once you've lifted the skin flap, you need to look for Loris fascia. This was described in 1974 by John Loris. It's the um, parotidotympanic fascia, it's very, very tight fibrous tissue, and this is a very good anchoring point for fixing your SMAS flap. Your SMAS, SMAS flap should start at least one to two centimeters anterior to this area here, so you retain all of this, because this part of the SMAS here is really bound down over to the parotid area, and it's thickened, and you can't really lift that, so you use this as an anchoring area for your SMAS flap. And here we are here. This is the SMAS layer. It's fibro fatty tissue. It seems to be indistinct. You need to handle it with care. This part here, when I dissect, I use what are called Trepsat dissectors. They're like spatulated scissors, but they don't cut. They gently tease the tissues apart. So you're not damaging the facial nerve branches, which will be coming up anteriorly in the face here and coming up into the ligament, you need to be very careful because as I've stated earlier, the SMAS area is here, here under here is where the facial nerve branches are and you need to be very careful, particularly when you're using bipolar diathermy hemostasis. So here's the SMAS flap elevated further and this is Bichet's fat pad or the buccal pad of fat. Some people want this removed as part of their surgery to give them even more enhanced cheekbones to give them this triangular effect. Some people take the fat from the neck, such as I do, and I graft fat and move it around the face. But just around here, you start getting branches of the facial nerve. The buccal branches, as we know, run very close to this buccal pad of fat. So knowledge of anatomy when you're lifting a SMAS flap, when you're doing a full deep plane facelift is essential. You've got to know your anatomy and be very wary that these facial nerve branches will be coming up from here and start coming more superficial the further anterior your dissection is. Once you've elevated your SMAS flap, you can move it, you can pull it back. And here you can see my system pulling. You can see my marks, but I've actually marked it out even more. This is where the zygoma is. I'm pulling that SMAS now, having removed, removed those or divided those retaining ligaments so I can move it back. And this is really what you're doing. You're pushing the SMAS back. This is the only really way is to show you is diagrammatically what I actually do. You can also divide where the platysma once was from the top of the SMAS flap. And I'll show you that in this video in a minute. What does happen 
when you move this mass flap, you redrape the skin and you see just how much, once you fix the SMAS or when you're pulling it, just how much excess skin there is. So you know that the mission is accomplished. You've elevated their face. But again, when you're pulling the skin back and you're re resecting excess skin to get it to fit over the ear and into the incision lines, you need to make sure that this is all very tension free because skin tension will cause scarring. All the tension should be on the SMAS underneath the skin. And then we go to the front of the neck. Again, I tend to move my incisions. This is an older slide I've used from before. I tend to go lower down now. And what are we trying to do when we're in the front of the neck? Well, you dissect widely underneath the skin. This is looking from the head downwards. And when I was asked to give this talk, I was asked to talk about liposuction. I don't really think liposuction works very well. I think lipectomy works very well. Most of the fat that accumulates and herniates through, these are the medial edges. Do you remember me showing that slide of the platysma? These are the medial edges of the platysma. This is the fat herniating through, causing that dewlap in the neck, the fatty appearance underneath a lot of women's skin. I undertake what's called a lipectomy. Just uh, let this, my slide is frozen a minute. There we are. Let's just go back one. So I actually resect all of this fat. I don't use liposuction. I don't like it. I, I, I think it's like a homeopathic resection of flat when you use uh, liposuction. I worry about sticking trocars into people's necks where there are lots of blood vessels. It's just a, a pet hate of mine. So I like to sculpt the neck directly by resecting that subplatismal flat beneath the platysma. You can just see one medial edge here and I'm teasing the fat out at the front. The next thing to do is to stitch these medial edges together. And you can see schematically, this is what you're trying to do. You're trying to give this corset effect to tighten up the front of the neck. And this can easily be done all the way down the neck. Some uh, surgeons, and I do this occasionally, I go even deeper once I've removed this fat and I apply Kate's, the two anterior um, heads of the uh, digastric muscle together, the anterior bellies together. The other's pitfall at this stage as well, and you should have noted it before operating, is to look what the patient's submandibular glands are doing. Some surgeons actually remove the submandibular gland anteriorly. I think this is a little bit dangerous. I've never done it, but I always warn a patient if she wants a facelift and she's quite old, be careful because you might have quite prominent submandibular glands here. You can try and stitch them up rather than remove them. You can dissect laterally and try and push them up, but it's problematic, the submandibular gland. So what I'm going to do in this video, I'm just going to show you um, what, uh, let's take the pen off a minute. Let's uh, turn it off. That's it. Good minute. I'm going to show you a video of basically what I've uh, been talking about. This summarizes everything quite nicely. This video is from uh, Giovanni Botti, he's Italian. And it shows how the, the SMAS layer is contiguous with the muscle, the platysma muscle here. This is what I was talking about. And then it's all removed. And then you're in the sub-SMAS area with the facial nerve uh, coming out. You can see it all. Just to remind you of all of the anatomy that you're dealing with, the deeper you get in the face. So there's the SMAS again. So as stated, you make your incision up in the temporal hairline, down behind the ear, and then you make an incision in the SMAS and you use these trepsat dissectors to get underneath the SMAS and you're gonna encounter the facial nerves coming out at you. You divide the retaining ligaments, being careful not to damage the facial nerve branches. And then that SMAS flap and platysma flap can be pulled laterally, like so. And then you can divide this flap if you want if you need to give a bit of more mid-face pull and then pull to the neck and you secure it to Laura's fascia here, to the temporalis and the mastoid. That's really all there is to it. And then you remove the excess skin and you close it. So here she is, this is my lady. This is seven days following her deep plank facelift. You can see I've pulled her a little bit too much on this side, but you can see her neck now looks smooth. She's lost these, this platysmal banding. She's also losing the marionette lines around her face. 
This is her at six months. She's had a little bit of relapse, but she looks natural. She doesn't look like she's had a facelift and she's happy. And this is the appearance you want to try and get. And again, this is a one week, little bit of bruising. I tend to use tranexamic acid uh, undertake facelifts. Obviously this is done under a general anesthetic surgery. And there she is at six months. You can just see a bit of scarring there. But again, she's lost these jowls. She's got now lost this marionette line. She still has some lines, but it, it looks a lot better than what it is. What about the younger woman? Would I do a deep plane facelift on her? I wouldn't. She was unhappy about her squared off jaw. She's 52. She said, I just hate this. I'm developing jowls. When you look at her face, she's developing very early jowling very early hints of marionette lines. She'd had filler put in here by another clinician and filler put here, but it still couldn't dis disguise the fact that her face is now descending. She's also going through the menopause. So you need to be careful with these patients um, because their faces can change quite rapidly. As you can see, her neck still looks like the neck of a 20 to 30 year old woman. So she's not gonna benefit this lady from a full facelift. She's gonna develop from a short scar facelift where you make the incision just in front of the ear and sometimes you make allowances just to go behind the ear a bit. I very rarely do actually extend this. It can be performed in an outpatient setting under local anaesthetic. And what you're doing with this type of patient, you're going to undertake what's called a SMAS plication. And I tend to use a Colorado needle. Again, I develop this skin flap, not too thin, um, but you undermine quite widely. There we are there. It's a little bit thicker, this flap in this woman. And there we are, you can transilluminate it still to show how thin it is. And there's the smaz here. Now at this juncture, you don't go underneath the smaz. You can if you want, but it wouldn't be worth it in this lady. What you can do, you can look and mark out with your marking pen, what area needs to be resected, or it can be folded over on itself. And this is known as a smaz plication. And similarly to the deep plane facelift, where I use 3.0 PDS sutures, I use 3.0 PDS sutures, just to um, plicate the smaz, I'm fixing it in on itself. Sometimes I will pull the smaz up and I will fix it to Laura's fascia, remember that fascia in front of the ear, and just up to the temporalis fascia. There's still a risk to the facial nerve in this procedure in that you could catch theoretically some of the branches of the facial nerve, but in my experience, I've never caused any permanent facial nerve damage. I've trademarked this in the UK, I call it the apex facelift because I'm trying to get rid of that squareness that I was showing you earlier. I'm trying to get the apex of the face back. And here she is afterwards. She's happy. Her skin is smoothed out. She's losing the marionette lines. And I think here is where you really see the difference in this three quarter view. She had this early jowling going on here with this tethering of the skin. She's had it smas plication, has pulled it all back and she's now got a lovely youthful jawline. So one size doesn't fit all. Think of the age of the patient. Think of what they want. In terms of scarring, this is her at six months. You can just see a faint line there. That's all there should be. So pearls and pitfalls, just some quick pearls and pitfalls. One size doesn't fit all. You have to tailor make your facelift and your neck lift to every different patient. You have to manage your patient's expectations. You're not gonna turn them into Angelina Jolie. You're just gonna turn the clock back slightly really. And you've really got to know your anatomy but choose your patients carefully. So let's talk about the eyelids, blepharoplasty. When people age, a lot of the issues with the lower eyelids are the sense of the malar fat pad, which is under here, but you've got these three fat pads here, which start to herniate through in the lower eyelid. And in the upper eyelid, not so much herniation, more really excess skin. And as we see, you start to get the sense of the lid cheek junction as you age. And again, this can happen quite quickly with females, certainly in the menopause is my experience. And again, be careful of operating women who are perimenopausal because your changes can be ruined quite quickly. Um, you get deepening of the nasolabial fold, we've seen. You then start to get this deformity where you get herniation of fat from the orbital septum becoming thinner. You get more scleral show, everything due to gravity, I guess, and loss of ligamentous support in the face starts to go south. So here we have a, a lady. She was 55. Um, you can see she's got these sort of excess area of skin, which is making application of makeup 
to her face very difficult. She couldn't put a mascara on or her eyeliner. She was finding it imp very um, difficult. She felt like heavy all the time, like her brow was descending on her eyelids, felt tired all the time. So when you're doing this, you have to kind of have in your mind, what is the perfect eyelid brow? Or what's the perfect ratio? Well, really, in a female, this should be about one to 1.4 1 centimeters, this, this uh, distance from the top of the eyelid margin, the ciliary margin up to the inferior aspect of the brow. And you should just have this area of tarsal plate that you can see. And that's what you're trying to aim. The other thing that's really important when you're assessing a patient for um, blepharoplasty surgery is whether they have um, brow descent. You can see here, when you lift the brow, you're actually looking for excess skin. Is it the brow that's causing it or is it the excess skin? And I always use two forceps just to measure out the excess skin and your inferior incision, which I've just dotted out with the patient sitting up in a woman is about 10 millimeters. In a male is about seven millimeters from the ciliary margin to this tarsal fold. And then this area here should be no smaller than a centimeter in terms of the excess skin that you're gonna excise here. So here we are measuring it out. And then you should have a patient here with equal amounts of skin ready. She's lying down, she's ready to have the infiltration of the local anesthetic. This should be symmetrical. If it isn't symmetrical, it should be nearly symmetrical. If it looks completely odd and different, you need to go back and measure things out again and just be sure how much skin you're removing. So as I said, I infiltrate the air with normal dental local anesthetic, 2% lignocaine, one in 80,000 adrenaline. You, I then use cautery. Um, I use a Colorado needle actually um, on setting number 12 and on blend. And I just lift the skin off first of all. And you can see here, it's very, very hemostatic. Then what I do, if I think that the patient's eyelids were looking quite heavy, and this is not done in every case, I then need to remove this strip of palpable orbicularis oculi muscle. And again, I mark it out and I use electrocautery. And this is about as far as I go in my blepharoplasty. Again, some surgeons, oculoplastic surgeons who have taught me to do this, um, they then start looking for the lacrimal gland up here and they, they fix it in with vicor. I don't do that, I, I try and keep it simple. If someone has a very herniated lacrimal gland, they're seeing oculoplastic surgeon. I keep my surgery very simple. This is the patient immediately afterwards. Um, you can see I use interrupted 6-OF long sutures. Sometimes I use proline, but I just prefer, because I take the stitches out myself a week later, I use interrupted ethylon sutures, topical chloramphenicol ointment, just balance salt solution to the eyes for a couple of days, and then I remove the sutures at five days. This is what they should look like at five days. Even with all that electrocautery using the Colorado needle, it's amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm very careful with my technique, but you can bruise around. It's amazing how the tissue planes open up, even when you're doing an upper blepharoplasty. But already you can see she's lost that excess skin. You can now see her tarsal aspects of her eyelids coming through. And here's the final result, much happier. She could probably do with some Botox in her uh, crow's feet area here, but you can see she's putting on the eyeliner now and the, the mascara on her eyes. She's got her eyelashes back, just to compare before and afterwards. It's really opened up her eyes and she has a sparkle in her eyes almost, I would say. So she's very happy. So we've lost this flap of skin. She's now got this definition of youth that you're looking for. So what about the lower blepharoplasty? Well, Again, just like every um, surgery you undertake, you must ensure that you know the anatomy very well. As we age, um, you get the descent of the uh, suborbital um, sub orbicularis muscle here, well, fat, this descends down. Um, you loosen up the SMAS, your malar fat pad descends. But you, the main reason why you undertake blepharoplasty surgery is you get attenuation of this orbital septum, which allows the contents of the orbit to herniate forward and give you uh, these eye bags, which patients complain, complain about. And here we have a lady in her 60s who came to see me. Um, she's, I would say she's a perfect case for lower blepharoplasties because she has very little wrinkling of the skin underneath um, her eyelids. And one of the things I warn patients of before surgery is, if you've got wrinkles under your skin now, 
even if I remove some of the skin as well as the fat, your wrinkles might be a little bit more accentuated. So be careful of that. You must warn patients of that. And I've been caught out in the past. So here she is, 66 years of age. She called these not her, her eye bags. She calls these her eye suitcases. She was so bothered by them. All my blepharoplasty approaches via a subsidiary approach. I know there are some surgeons who undertake transconjunctival. Most of my patients are in their 50s, 60s, 70s even. And I believe if you're going to be doing blepharoplasty on these surgeries, there's going to be excess skin. So you might as well undertake the transcutaneous approach. And it's just like the approach to a, a fractured orbit. Just beneath the lash margin, first of all, I make a small incision just laterally here. And then I use my scissors to go underneath the skin to create a tunnel, just like you would for approaching an orbit. I then make a, 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 a skin flap and then a skin muscle flap, which you can just basically see up the top here. When you've done that, I use copious amounts of, uh, I use uh, cotton buds to just dissect everything out of the way. And I get to the, um, the septum here, which is arrowed. And you can also already see in this patient here that I'm operating on, there is some dehiscence of fat through the septum, which thins out and attenuates as we age. And again, I use a Colorado needle just to open up the fat and get to the medial fat pads, first of all. And I gently tease them out. I never do this operation under general anesthetic. I mean, under local anesthetic, I always do it under general anesthetic. I've tried doing it under local. And when I tease the muscle out, I found if the patient's awake, they start to feel sick. It's almost like you're creating a, some sort of autonomic nervous reflex, I think, when you're pulling the orbital fat, no matter how gentle you are, no matter how much local there is, you can't do this, in my experience, under local. I always do it under general. You tease the fat. And you must make sure that when the fat's coming out, you use bipolar cautery to make sure this hemostasis, because remember, this fat is going to be dropping back into the orbit and you don't want a retrobulbar hemorrhage or any problems like that. So meticulous hemostasis is the key. Once you've removed all the fat, I close the uh, orbital septum with vicral sutures. And I then use a flap of the orbicularis oculi to then just gently pull in this direction and the reason why I do that I want this muscle and skin flap pulled hard against the globe which is a little bit uncomfortable for the patient first of all but this prevents ectropium which as you know when you're dividing uh, the, the orbicularis oculi fibers you can actually cause some of the retractor fibers to be damaged and uh, you can cause an ectropium so this part is sutured right up in the, the lateral canthal area. I, I make a tunnel. Or if I've done upper blepharoplasties, I just make this a through and through tunnel, much like the face and neck lift, they meet these two incisions. And here's our lady. You can see she had these big, big bags and she's now flat here and actually not too much wrinkling. I think she could have benefited from an upper blepharoplasty, but she didn't want it and I didn't want to push it. But you can see she looks much more youthful in the lower part of her eyelids. So again, with blepharoplasty surgery, careful assessment of the patient, don't get their expectations too high. You must know your anatomy. And I think if you're starting out in blepharoplasty surgery for the junior surgeons that are listening to this, don't resect too much fat because you can make your patient look too old. Um, and there are some newer techniques, which I'm not going to go in today, where you don't resect the fat, you actually redrape the fat around into the um, malar area to um, disguise that malar fat pad descent. So you don't always have to resect fat. But remember, always manage your patient's expectations. That's the most important issue in any cosmetic surgery. So in summary of all of this, um, Careful clinical assessment is very important. Listen to the patient, listen to their concerns. Can you manage their concerns? Can you achieve what they want? As I've shown with facelift surgery, you need to tailor make it. One size doesn't fit all for the patient. I don't think we should be doing deep plane facelifts on patients in their mid forties and fifties. They will look like they've got the artificial lifted look of the 1980s and nineties. I think my experience of facelift surgery now, it's becoming more minimalistic. The short scar facelift that I undertake, which I've trademarked as the apex facelift. People wanna come in and see you in a clinic, have it done while they're awake under local anesthetic and then go home and recover in three to four days time. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Daryl Coombs. It was a, a very interesting and um, a fantastic presentation and seeing your results, it, it is really amazing. Thank um, you, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, coming to the uh, questions on facelift. Yeah. How do you decide whether you have to imbrigate or do a smasectomy or smas plication? That's, that's a very good question. Um, when you've lifted the skin flap, well, first of all, you should assess the patient. If you know you've got a patient with a very thin face, uh, such as the lady I showed you, you're really just going to do um, smas plication or well, imbricate it. You're just going to fold it because there's not going to be that much excess tissue in her face. If you have uh, a lady who has a typically like a heavy face or she quite looks... I don't know, it's a, the right term. Her, her lips look podgy, if you like. There seems to be a lot of subcutaneous fat. There's going to be a lot of fatty tissue within that smas, and that's when I'd undertake a smasectomy or a plication. I can fold it back. And let's not forget, if someone has a lot of fat, you, as I said earlier in my talk, you can move that fat around to redistribute it, and it can look quite nice to give them a bit of a cheekbone effect, if you like. Hopefully that's answered the question. Yeah. Um, so when you when you make an incision on the smash to dissect yeah. a deep deep plane, yeah. Uh, do you have any particular landmark where you uh, use the horizontal incision? I mean, the horizontal. I, yeah, I do actually. I didn't mention actually. Thanks for pointing that out. I normally mark out where the zygomatic arch is, so the top horizontal incision really runs just beneath the zygomatic arch. And the reason why it's just below the zygomatic arch is because you remember the zygomatic or the frontal branches of the facial nerve run just up over the arch. And I try and stay away from going any higher than that. So I just make my mark just below the zygomatic arch. It's a good question. It's a good point raised. Thank you. And uh, do you anchor this mass to um, any, any part deep plane in the superficial, I mean, superior region? Like uh, yeah. yeah, in the superior region, I, I anchor the SMAS to the superficial temporalis fascia, basically. And you have to be careful you don't uh, pick off any of the frontal branch of the facial nerve. But if you pull it back posterior enough, almost to the sort of top of the pinna, almost, um, dissect a little bit under your skin flap posteriorly, you can stay well away from that. So that's where I anchor that to at the top. Yeah, and that's very thick fascia, which you can uh, secure it to nicely. And I use 3O PDS sutures, sometimes 4O PDS, but mainly PDS sutures for that. Thank you so much uh, for answering all the questions. Um, and now we move on to uh, Professor Toro for his uh, rhinoplasty session. Thank you so much, Dr. Daryl Combs. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me again. I hope it was useful for everyone. Yes, it was indeed. Uh, Sorry, Dr. Sai, Suresh here. Sir. There is one more question on the chat box. Someone wants to know what is the name of the scissors that is used for small layer dissection? Oh, Any the, particular the, scissors? The instrument, what it's used, it's called a TREPSAT, T-R-E-P-S-A-T, TREPSAT dissectors. They look like, um, it's interesting, I probably should have put a picture of them up. They look like when you look up a patient's nose with the fundiculums to look, you can use that for the dissection as well. They're just like two spatulas that okay. open and close like that. And you just push it and push it as you get further and further. And you open up the blades of it, but they're not sharp. And it stops you tearing any vessels or tearing any branches of the facial nerve. Trepsat dissectors, that's what I use. Very useful instrument. Good question. Thank you. Shall we go on to Dr. Yes. David? We can move on, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Dr. David, sir? Yes. Yes, sir. You can take from here. Sure. Can you see that? Yes, sir can see and we can hear you as well. Yeah. Go to play, sir. Play, play. Yeah. Yes. They
Yeah. Can you see that now? Hello? Yes, sir. You can go ahead. Yeah. Um, first, thank you very much for this invitation, uh, Sainath and Jensen. Um, I'm going to talk to you on uh, aesthetic vinoplasty. Essentially, this is a lecture um, not essentially on, on, on uh, techniques and uh, the nitty gritty of things. I'm just going to give an overview and an insight into what uh, aesthetic vinoplasty is all about. Now, I think for those of you in the pursuit of aesthetic vinoplasty, um, one must have an idea about the entire scheme of things. You need to have an idea of the surgical anatomy, a thorough understanding of the evaluation and assessment of a case. One must understand the terminologies and techniques, understand the various augmentation materials that are available, the source of autologous cartridge that is available, planning and execution, and uh, complications as well. Now to go into briefly into these areas, the external anatomy of the nose and the internal anatomy should be well understood. You need to know the aesthetic subunits of the nose. Now this is just a diagram illustrating the aspects of uh, the aesthetic subunits of the nose. You can, uh, you will understand that each component uh, uh, is very important if you have to embark on this pursuit of aesthetic rhinoplasty. You can see the, the nose is divided into the, the lower and the upper half. You have the columella, you have the tip of the nose, you have the dorsum, the lateral wall, and uh, the soft triangle, and uh, the uh, ala basis. This is the skeletal anatomy of the nose, the osteocartilaginous component of the skeletal ana anatomy of the nose should be well understood, the articulations of the bones of the uh, uh, sorry skeleton. To David, sir. Sorry to interrupt, are you changing yes. your slides? Yes, I am. But we cannot uh, see your slides, sir. Only the first introduction, aesthetic rhinoplasty, uh, uh, your introduction slide is there. Yes. I know, one moment. I, I don't know. Is it not changing there? No. Can you minimize and uh, uh, again play? I know. Ah, now play it, sir. Now we can see, sir. Just play it. Yeah, one moment. Can you see that now? No, the screen is blank. We can't see the slide. It's dark. Can you change the next slide? Whether that's fine. No, sir, it's still black. It's dark. You can't see the slide. Hmm. Sir, maybe you can start from the first slide, sir. Yeah. The beginning of the person. Ah, yes, sir. You can close it and uh, restart. I mean, open, reopen it. I'm trying to do that. Can you hear me, actually? Yes, yes, very much. One in two. I'm unable to reduce the screen as well. You can stop the screen share, then restart.
can I stop the screen share for you? Then you can restart. Yes, please do that. Yeah, now sir, uh, don't do not go into that, uh, I mean, the presentation mode, you can change a slide like this. And then there will not be any issue. Okay. Can you see that now? Yes. 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 Has the flag changed? Sir? Is it changing? Yeah, yeah, now it's changing, now it's changing. Now it's changing, sir. Yes, you can go ahead with your second slide. So shall I go ahead and play it again? Shall I try playing it again? Yeah, yeah, please try. Now? Now it's completely uh, black, I think. Now it's blank, blank. Oh, blank. Yes. Are you looking like this? Yes, sir. Is that okay? Yes. yes sir. So I can't go on the play mode. No, you can't. Yes. No, no. You can press. Uh, you can press it like this, sir. It's it's very. Yes, yeah. no, if you go on the play mode, it will pause. Okay. So you have to do it like this. It's clear. So sir. I'll go ahead. Yeah. I'll go ahead with the the same thing. Okay. Yes. Right. Uh, let me start again. This lecture is on uh, aesthetic rhinoplasty and overview and insight. For those, for those of you who are in the pursuit of uh, aesthetic rhinoplasty, should be well aware uh, of the following scheme. You should be familiar with the surgical anatomy of the nose. You should be well versed with the evaluation of, and assessment terminologies and techniques, augmentation materials, source of autologous, autologous cartilage, planning and execution, and complications. Now, familiarize with the aesthetic subunits of the nose. Uh, this is a diagram which illustrates the aesthetic subunits. This is the columella, the tip, the super tip, the dorsum of the nose, lateral wall, the ala, and the soft triangle. Now this is the, the uh, osteocartilage in the skeleton. The, the, the lower half of the nose is predominantly contributed by the cartilages. Here you have, in green, you have the, the lower lateral cartilage, the upper lateral cartilages, and the septum that contribute to the lower cartilage in the skeleton. The upper skeleton, the osteoskeleton, skeleton is contributed by the, the nasal bones and partly by the uh, nasal process of the maxilla. Now you can appreciate the, the articulation of the upper lateral cartilage that go underneath the, the uh, bony skeleton. And it's important for you to understand this when you're doing a rhinoplasty, particularly if you're doing a, a lateral nasal osteotomies as well. Now on the right side, you will see uh, the septal anatomy. This is again contributed by two bones and the, the uh, nasal cartilage in the septum. Remember the caudal end of the septum has two angles and this is what contributes to the external appearance of the columella and the uh, tip and the super tip break. And this is very important. And when you look at this septum, this is uh, uh, a septum where, can, where you can harvest about two thirds of the, the septum leaving about seven to eight millimeters of the superior and the cardinal margin. One must do a thorough preoperative assessment. 
one needs to know the nasal proportions look at the nose from the frontal oblique and lateral profile look at the radix and the dorsum tip projection and support basal view and proportions and the nasal skin do a thorough nasal examination internal and external look at the nasion the dorsum the cartilages the tip the columella the ala base and the skin the internal examination of the nose is very important look at it from the basal view you can use the cervical speculum to examine the internal nose look at the septum look at the 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 nasal valves you might have patients with perforations of the septum so you need to actually look at uh, the septum very carefully these are two pictures uh, depicting the technique on the left you will see this is a uh, uh, an open rhinoplasty technique where you can visualize the entire osteocartilage skeleton of the nose on the right you will see a, a close technique where you can do a delivery technique of the lower uh, uh, lateral cartilages and essentially these are two techniques open and close techniques there are various incisions that you can employ for close and open approaches you can use them either as one incision or a combination of these a transcolumellar incision for a transcolumellar combined with a marginal incision is a common incision that is used for an open procedure a killian uh, approach is for the the septum you can do a hemitransfection or a full transfection or whatever you are comfortable with there are several types of uh, nasal osteotomies that you can do you can do an internal or an external nasal osteotomy and external osteotomy is much easier however having said that one must be familiar with the nasal osteocartilage anatomy before you actually embark on to an internal nasal anatomy because you're doing it from the, uh, the lower end of the uh, nasal valve uh, you have what is called wear wedge excisions that you can do to control the ala bases and you have the modified wear wedge uh, excisions as well now these are some of the components of the tip plasty if you are embarking on what is called only a tip plasty you need to carry out some of these procedures combine them depending on uh, the type of tip plasty that you want to do you may have to do a cephalic trimming if if the uh, the lateral component of the uh, lower lateral cartilage is wide you need to score them if you want to mold them intradermal and transdermal sutures to bring them together and narrow them to give a definition to the tip you can also do a crudal spanning stitch to reduce the width of the nose and uh, dome division also is a technique that can be used in a closed rhinoplasty to actually uh, increase the projection of the tip These are some of the terminologies used for various types of grafts that are used in rhinoplasty. You have what is called a radius graft, a dorsal strut graft, a columellar strut, a cap graft, a shield graft, ala graft, plumping graft, sheen graft, and bedding graft. These are various types of grafts that are used according to the need uh, in terms of improving the tip or the dorsum or giving greater projection to the dorsum and tip together. So you can use a combination of all these grafts. There are various types of augmentation materials that can be used in in rhinoplasty. These are some of the autografts and some of the allografts. Now, if you look at the literature, you will find that cartilage is perhaps the most uh, uh, common graft that is used for uh, rhinoplasty, and it is available in abundance. Allografts, silicon is commonly used. Having said that. if you look at uh, the literature you will discover that cartilage graft is perhaps one of the best graft that can be used for uh, rhinoplasty and literature is replete with uh, enough information on different types of grafts you will also see that the index of resorption uh, of the cartilage graft is minimal so autogenous cartilage is easy to obtain and one can mold it the long term low index of resorption and preservation of the desired shape it's very economical and versatile 
outstanding material for volume filling and structural support when large amounts of tissue are needed. Now, this is the source of the autologous cartilage grafts. Nasal septum can be used when the requirement is minimal. Conchal grafts, you can use heart, harvest unilateral or bilateral, uh, depending on the need. Costal cartilage graft is available in abundance. You can harvest one or two ribs, and you can have enough cartilage available even from a single uh, graft harvest. Now, these are pictures that show you the, the uh, harvest of the conchal cartilage. Here, you can actually do what is called an anterior approach or a posterior approach, uh, depending on how comfortable you are. Either doesn't matter, you can see the results of this uh, anterior harvest, Hard, produces hardly any uh, scarring in the anterior antelical region. The incision goes along the antelical crease. And this conchal cartilage graft can be used for various procedures. You can use it for, you can mosselize this cartilage uh, to use it as mosselized graft uh, to augment the radix. You can use it for ALA reconstruction. You can use it as a cap graft you know, on, on, on a triplasty. You can use it as a plumping graft to plump certain areas. You can use it also as a columnar graft where you can uh, sort of roll it and uh, stabilize it and strengthen it and reinforce it by using some sutures. You can also, it's not particularly useful as a dorsal strut because it, it, it does not produce that sort of a, a straight shape and uh, the rigidity you require for a dorsal strut. Now, this is a slide showing you a harvest of the costal cartilage. You could harvest uh, costal cartilage from the fifth rib all the way down to six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, whichever is convenient. Uh, fifth rib, you get a rigid one. You can use the core of this to get a straight strut like this to, in, to, to use it as a dorsal strut. You can use the rest of it to use it as a, a, a sheen graft or a shield graft or even a basin graft. So these are the grafts that can be designed by using a, a, what is called a costal cartilage graft. Now, planning and execution is paramount. The, the approach, one can decide on whether you need to do an open or a closed approach, and one needs to decide on the graft requirements as well, whether it, if it's a small graft requirement, you can actually harvest the septum, and if it's a large one, uh, you can actually harvest uh, the costal cartilage. Always make a problem list you have the entire problem list on your left hand side. Make a list of all the problems that you have with that particular nose. And I have a thorough plan and a sequence of events because you cannot do uh, or reverse the, the sequence in a rhinoplasty. You need to do your, for example, you need to do your tipplasty, start with the tipplasty, go on to do a dorsal augmentation, then the nasal osteotomies and the wear with excision is essentially done even after the, the, the closure of the nose. So there is a definite sequence that needs to be followed with the rhinoplasty. And hence, it's best that you list out the sequence, have a proper plan, and stick it up in your theater so that you do not miss out on uh, small uh, issues and the nitty-gritty of the procedure. Splinting is uh, very important. Uh, should you forget to splint internally or externally, depending on what sort of rhinoplasty it is, you might end up with uh, excessive swelling and uh, hematoma and infection also can uh, um, be seen if you do not actually splint the nose adequately. Now, a word on complications. You have complications uh, uh, in terms of general complication and specific complication. Generally, you can have pain and swelling, bleeding and infection. You can end up with undesirable results, unrealistic expectations and uh, a very unhappy patient. Most of the times, it's very difficult to please uh, 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 rhinoplasty patients, and uh, you inevitably have unhappy patients with your rhinoplasty cases. You can have specific complications. Probably, I will show you one or two at the end of this lecture. Uh, specific complications like skin necrosis, stenosis of the valves, the external and internal valves. 
nostril asymmetry is pretty common graft deviation can occur if you not stabilize it well and also i've seen cases of skin discoloration as well now what i'll do is uh, kind of skim through a few uh, cases to give you uh, an insight into what uh, can be done with different types of procedures now here's uh, a few series of uh, polybeak deformity corrections you can have uh, a mild deformity a mild polybeak to an exaggerated one now this is uh, a mild polybeak that has been corrected and these are the different views here's another patient with a polybeak uh, deformity correction and uh, another one here remember this this looks pretty easy when you actually uh, reduce the dorsum you need to assess the tip of the nose and the the lower lateral cartilage uh, prior to doing this because uh, whenever you do a resection of the dorsum you end up with two problems one is you can actually get a tip droop uh, because of inadequate support and very many times you need to kind of support the nasal tip if the lower lateral cartilage is are stiff enough you can actually bring them together and stabilize them to give that support if not you might end up with also putting a small strut in the columnar area to give that support also when you do this dorsal resection you'll end up with what is called uh, an open dorsum where you you'll have to uh, do spreader grafts to to control the internal nasal valve or you might end up with uh, internal valve nasal stenosis uh, internal valve stenosis over a period of time so you need to put uh, uh, spreader grafts in these uh, situations when you do a dorsal resection so this is uh, uh, one tip about dorsal resection uh, for polybeak correction now slump noses are pretty common and uh, you can see some results of uh, slump noses now to give you an idea about uh, how you would correct a slump nose very many times uh, dr sainath was asking me about uh, a bulbous tip and an amorphous tip you will always see a slump nose with, with uh, a very amorphous tip a very wide nasal tip as well it could be sometimes bulbous and droopy as well so you can see this case in in the basal view you can see that this is a pretty boxy tip although you don't see it in in the frontal projection so this is why you need to assess the uh, all noses in all the views uh, the frontal obliques profiles and basal views uh, you can see that this is a very boxy tip and this has been augmented and uh, very many times when you do a dorsal augmentation you also need to do a tip plasty for these cases do a tip plasty bring the uh, cartilage together add columnar support and sort of balance the dorsal augmentation with the tip augmentation because you you can end up with uh, uh, an anesthetic nose if you do not really support the tip so this is uh, uh, the kind of augmentation that you see with a dorsal strut and the columnar strut with the with the tip cartilages together uh here is again uh, a very wide nose amorphous tip dorsal augmentation and tip plasty as well and uh, a bit of a narrowing of the ala basal here again is uh, another similar situation nothing different about these cases uh, a dorsal augmentation uh, with a tip plasty and columnar support and you can see uh, significant changes that you can actually get in terms of uh, the uh, external nares and a simple columnar strut and vertical augmentation can produce uh, the change in the disposition of the nares here they are dis disposed horizontally and this is the uh, right disposition of the uh, external nares uh, here's again a uh, undulated dorsum uh, that has been corrected with uh, rasping and dorsal augmentation graft with the tip plasty and columnar strut here is a northeastern girl with a uh, flat nose obviously requires uh, dorsal augmentation and uh, a tip plasty very many times dorsal augmentations are combined with the tip plasty as i said and here you can see here's a girl with a notched tip a slumping of the dorsum and ill defined tip 
and that's the augmentation with uh, tip plus the and uh, well-defined tip. Now, a word on alloplastic uh, materials. Many times, uh, patients do not subscribe to uh, to to harvesting a, a, a cartilage graft, be it the conchal or the uh, septal or be it the conchal or the the, the uh, uh, cartilage uh, from the chest. So in those situations, you may have to opt uh, for alloplastic augmentation. There are a variety of uh, materials that are available for alloplastic augmentation. Uh, the common one that is available is silicon implant. You can get a variety of those for dorsal augmentation and uh, columnar augmentation as well. A variety of drops are available. And uh, here are some results of uh, uh, augmentations and corrections done using a, a silicon implant. Here's this girl, the silicon implant. Uh, you get these uh, straight dorsal grafts. You get columnar grafts separately, or you can get a combination of an L graft, and you need to choose the graft depending on what you need to do. Um, here's another patient with uh, uh, silicon implant. And uh, that's her in the two views. And that's the basic view. You can see the disposition of the nostrils that is changed with uh, the augmentation. Now, thick skin noses. Um, one must be very cautious when you're dealing with thick skin. It's very important for you to understand that uh, correction of a thick skin nose is much, much more difficult because the, the manifestation of the osteocartonous chain that you bring about uh, is not really seen through the thick skin. In those situations, here are two patients. You can see very boxy nose, very thick skin, um, very sebaceous skin, very oily, and uh, very thick skin. You will always discover that the, the, the cartilages are very weak in these thick skin patients. They need uh, extensive cartilaginous work for modifying these particular noses. You may not really end up with good results with thick skin. At times, you may have to actually do what is called a fibrofatty resection of the, the uh, lower half of the nose. It's a little dicey procedure. You can't go too thin. And you may also end up with the skin necrosis. I've had one or two patients with skin necrosis uh, after having done... Uh, uh, as a, a fibro fatty resection. You need to be very, very cautious uh, when you do this uh, resection. The extent of osteocartilage work here required is phenomenal, and uh, the cartilages are weak. You can't bring about uh, significant changes, and these are some heroic things that one can do. Uh, you can see this uh, This is a dorsal strut with the columnar. I mean, the, uh, technically it's the same, but uh, to bring about the change, you need to put larger graphs. Although you can see that uh, change is uh, very obvious from the basal views. I've also done a rear wedge accession that you can see uh, it's a little early picture. Having said that, uh, this is the kind of change that you can get with thick skin. Um, here's this girl with that very boxy thick skin and uh, looks good in the basal view a good projection, a nice pyramid that is seen from the basal view, and a significant change that you can see, a huge uh, dorsal strut uh, with a tip procedure, a, a columnar strut, a shield graft, and uh, all the features necessary to bring the, the cartilages together. Now, here are some uh, cases uh, where you can see the results. All the ones that you saw earlier are all open structure rhinoplasties. And here are some uh, clinical pictures of cases where you can actually do a, a closed rhinoplasty. And here's this where minimal tip procedures can be done to uh, bring about changes in the tip of the nose. Uh, here's that tip that has been corrected with the closed approach. And that's uh, with that tip correction. Here again, a little bit of dorsal augmentation and uh, a tip enhancement, and that's uh, in the different views. Here's another patient with uh, a, a subtle tip uh, correction. 
and that's her in the different views, a very subtle tip uh, correction. Uh, in these closed procedures, you may have to actually bring about uh, uh, approximation of the, the, the uh, medial crura, uh, bring it together, and at times uh, also you may have to do what is called an intradomal stitch to give that rigidity to the tip and bring about that sharpness you you bring the you do what is called a, a transdermal suture as well so these are cases that have been corrected with uh, uh, a closed rhinoplasty technique you can see that the tip is lifted up it has produced uh, to an extent a uh, mild super tip break as well uh, the columnar shoe is also improved and an oral projection of the tip here again is a, a closed procedure. Uh, subtle tip elevation has been done uh, utilizing a, a, a tip plastic technique just by bringing the uh, cartilages together, propping them up with uh, those sutures that I mentioned earlier. Similarly, again, uh, another patient with uh, a closed approach, and uh, you can see that uh, tip definition. These are very subtle changes that can be brought about with the close rhinoplasty and subtle tip uh, enhancements. Now, just to touch upon some complications that I mentioned earlier, you can have a huge list of complications, but I will show you one of the pictures of some complications. Some of mine and some I've seen patients who have come to me with complications. This is a girl who, who, who came to me you can see that uh, there is uh, asymmetry of the nostrils. Look at it from the lateral projection, you will see that she's got some sort of undulation of the dorsum, stippling on the dorsum. You can see that this nasolabial angle is very obtuse. Uh, it is all related to the technique that you have done. So you can end up with an anesthetic obtuse projection of the nose. This also is a pretty bad aesthetic complication that you can get. And you can see if you watch this carefully, there is a lot of stippling on the dorsum. I do not know why. And here you can see there is some sort of discoloration as well. So this is something that I've uh, not commonly seen. The patient came to me and I took these pictures just to illustrate this point. Here's uh, uh, another complication that you can see that uh, overt resection of the fibro fatty tissue uh, with this particular nose has resulted in this sort of uh, sort of a pressure necrosis and maybe some extent of avascular necrosis because when you splint this and you've done a resection, it can lead to some sort of uh, compression of the area leading to some sort of necrosis of this nature. Mind you, this is a nose that should not be operated on. You can look at the skin. This is one of the worst skins I've ever seen. Very thick skin very sebaceous, very amorphous, and this is not a nose that should be touched by anyone. So this is, not, this is a nose that you cannot improve significantly, and uh, a fibro fatty thick nose is something that you should be uh, very cautious about. So I would like to summarize by putting these three points that uh, rhinoplasty can definitely improve facial form, facial balance, improve aesthetics by altering the uh, shape, the contour angulation, projection of the nose. Now, desirable or optimal results in nasal sculpting is possible based on a very thorough understanding of the osteocartilaginous anatomy of the nose and the essential physiology of the nose. An understanding of the biology and behavior of cartilage and the dynamics of rhinoplasty is uh, obviously mandatory for uh, anyone. Now, the take-home message is uh, have a very, very guarded approach when you're dealing with thick skin envelope, as I said earlier. Do not attempt a closed approach unless you have mastered the open technique, because in a, in a closed technique, what you're actually trying to do is uh, uh, trying to understand the anatomy uh, under the skin without even looking at it. So it, it, it's more or less a blind approach. So you need to know your anatomy well, understand you, an understanding of the anatomy is better when you do an open technique, 
you know where the cartilages lie, where they end, the articulations, the attachments, and the behavior of the cartilage is well understood when you do an open approach. So uh, you do a hundred open approaches before you actually uh, embark on a closed uh, technique. And having said that, a closed technique uh, is more for subtle corrections uh, and the open one is for more gross changes. Um, having ex have had a lot of experience, uh, I discovered that uh, the ethnic variations actually lead you to do uh, whether a closed or an open approach. In the Indian context, I feel uh, most noses which come to you are, are uh, noses that require uh, an open approach because the extent of work that you need to do with an with, the, uh, with these noses is much more. The osteocartilaginous framework needs to be altered significantly to have a manifested change uh, from the exterior. So most Indian noses uh, require an open approach, although you do have patients uh, where you can choose uh, selectively to do a closed approach, as I showed you in my previous uh, pictures. So predictable results can be achieved only with a protracted period of very good training and experience in, in rhinoplasty for. Uh, I believe uh, rhinoplasty is not the, the novice surgeon. One must have uh, a great experience with uh, and uh, have had worked with uh, rhinoplasty surgeon before you actually embark on this pursuit of uh, doing the rhinoplasty. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, sir. It was indeed an excellent presentation and marvelous results, what you've shown. Um, you have covered the entire uh, kind of deformities and the aesthetic approaches to it, um, and as well as um, um, the techniques. There's one question um, yeah. from the, uh, from the uh, attendees. Have you have any experience on using silicon allografts for the rhinoplasties. Yes, uh, I think I showed uh, a couple of cases in the towards the end of the presentation. Um, the ones that you see, is my screen on? Can you see these pictures? Yes, 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 sir. Yeah, these are some of the cases uh, where I've used uh, silicon implants and uh, it does produce uh, good results. Having said that, uh, you cannot tailor your graft to your needs with a silicon implant because you have a preformed silicon implant already in your hand and you need to actually use it the way it is. Uh, I do not know if you can really modify it too much. Um, so with, with uh, autogenous uh, graph, you can actually shape it, narrow it, widen it, keep it the way you want. But with a silicon implant, uh, you have a desired shape and size, and you need to stick it in whether you like it or not. Um, the results with the cartilage is better, definitely better with better than uh, cart, I mean, uh, silicon implants. Um, with silicon, you can have problems with extrusion and things like that if you have not really secured the silicon well. So silicon against autogenous, I would al always prefer autogenous graft. Thank you, sir. So do you believe uh, that the uh, nose changes with the races? Sorry? Do you believe that the nose architecture or the aesthetic built of the nose change with races like Indians, Europeans, Asians? Yes, uh, to an extent, yes. Uh, um, essentially, when you see, uh, let us say, an African nose or a European nose, you will see that the, the, the texture of the cartilage is different uh, with the different race. Now, uh, Europeans have very stiff uh, lower cartilages, and the cartilage and skeleton is much stiffer with the European noses, unlike the African. Uh, where the nose is very thick, the skin is very thick. So essentially, when you see a thick nose, you'll be sure that the cartilages are very, very thin and flimsy. Uh, Indian noses are somewhere in between. You do have, uh, when you see thin skin, uh, you have stiff cartilages. And uh, the leeway for error with thick 
uh, thinner skin is much less as compared to thicker skins because what you see through is um, uh, with a thicker skin is uh, you have a big leeway for error uh, with a thicker skin. Yes. Um, why I asked you this question is, uh, for example, if you, I, I have a personal experience of a couple of my patients with uh, Asian nose. They came yeah. to me, uh, the problem list was the saddle nose and a broad tip. But they don't, they don't want the saddle nose to be corrected because it's the race. They want yeah. only the tip plasty. They want sharpening yeah. of the tip. So uh, in that context, I asked you this question. And um, I don't think so there's any other question. Uh, sir, uh, there's one more question. Last question. So, what is your approach to complications? As in, what a next step? Second surgery or adjust with the results? Well, uh, when you say complication, uh, you can have any sort of complication because an anahati patient itself is a complication. So, um, for example, the one that I showed you, you get necrosis, is a big, big challenge. Uh, you need to use some. Uh, what is called U graft and uh, you know materials that can resurface the skin, and um, if if it's a real complication where the, the 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 result is undesirable, you may have to go in and do a second uh, entry or a third entry and so on. I do get patients who have had rhinoplasty thrice, four times, five times, and uh, uh, those are a nightmare because you know. There's so much of fibrosis and it's very difficult to correct. Uh, always the first entry is the best. But having said that, you will have patients, your own and other patients who come from elsewhere uh, to see you to get the nose corrected the second or third time. Thank you very much, sir. We go on to the uh, third uh, uh, present, uh, presentation on hair transplant surgery by Dr. Sridhar Reddy. Dr. Sridhar Reddy, are you there? Yes. Can yeah. you hear me, Dr. Sainath? Yes. You can start with the... Uh, presentation and uh, the questions which has not been answered uh, will be answered in the end uh, as we are running a little short of time sure. Thank you. yeah you can uh, you can start with i think uh, my screen still dr david sir uh, uh, yes i can ask. give me a second Sainath, can you see my presentation now? Yes, yes. Can you see me? Yes. Yes. Can. can I go ahead? Yes. Uh, good evening, all. Thanks for this uh, opportunity uh, presenting this uh, hair transplant cases today with uh, my lovely teachers and seniors and colleagues and friends. Thanks, uh, one and all. Uh, I would like to discuss with uh, this uh, hair transplant uh, surgeries and some people say it is hair restoration. Uh, I would like to present you. Uh, cases here rather than just going with the uh, information. Uh, this basically, uh, before talking about the cases, I just would like to go with uh, uh, the techniques basically in air transplantation FUT and the FUE. Uh, FUT is nothing but a strip method or follicular even transplant. The FUE is a uh, layman's terms, uh, they say scarless method and uh, follicular even extraction it is. So, uh, in olden days, usually you know, a lot many other techniques were there, but as of now, this FUE is most popular because of the uh, less uh, invasive surgery. The FUT was a gold standard method till today because there are a few advantages to that. Now, let us start with the uh, case presentation. Meanwhile, I discuss the basic techniques of the uh, transplantation too. Uh, here. Yeah, uh, this patient is a uh, class uh, early class six or class five V. We can say the class five V means uh, class five vortex. Before that, we just would like to go with the uh, classification to the baldness. Uh, it starts from class one to class seven, and uh, class one is a receding hairline, whereas the class seven is having only rim of hairs in the back and complete area is uh, bald. Whereas other uh, uh, types like a diffuse pattern, grade one, grade two, grade three, also nowadays is most popular because this diffuse pattern is nothing but 
having hair all over the scalp, which is very thin. Probably they may not be a good candidates for uh, hair transplant. So here, class one, class two looks uh, almost uh, very natural, and uh, I don't think uh, those guys would require any transplant. That is very common in uh, uh, receding hairline when age of 22 to 25. Whereas class two A to class seven guys with MPB, that is male pattern baldness, are androgenetic alopecia are right candidates for hair transplantation. So unlike any other surgery, hair transplant surgery is the only surgery you get the results after eight months. So you can understand the patient bothersome, keep bothering you until eight months you get the hair. Now, this patient, uh, I uh, patient himself wanted the FUT method and that is a strip method. He had his own uh, um, options. And even I preferred FUT for him because of few reasons. The, here, if you can observe the donor of the backside actually is very thick. This hair is very thick. And in this case, we just mark this way and having more hair in the frontal area and little in the vertex area. And remember, this uh, designing this hairline is most important. Most of the patients will tell you, one centimeter, can you, why can't you bring it down? So one thing we have to remember, imagine one centimeter, if you can bring down the hairline in this patient, approximately from measuring here, this end to this end, we almost it will be more than 25 square centimeters. You need extra grafts there. So I don't think that's a good idea. Most of the beginners, amateur surgeons will end up in having very bad complications, just bringing one centimeter or two centimeters, bringing the hairline down, which they need uh, more grafts. Usually air grafts, availability of hair grafts in any given patient is less. So always demand is more, supply is less. That's my basic point. One should always keep in our mind. Here, this is the results after uh, uh, seven months. Of course, the complete results will be seen after nine months to 10 months. And this is only one session. One session. Let me go with the details about this case. Uh, case details for a patient male, uh, male 29 years. Um, almost, uh, this is not class seven, sorry. This is class uh, six or class five V and our early six. Having a thick donor in the backside, I already discussed. So it is diagnosed as MPV, that is male pattern baldness. Why we are talking about diagnosis is all the bald people cannot go for transplant. So only androgenetic alopecia patients can go with the uh, uh, transplantation because the important uh, point in this is uh, provided thick hair in the backside is the most important key factor for the hair transplantation. So protein blood investigations are mandatory for uh, uh, hair transplant. Most of the patients will ask us why we need uh, hair transplant uh, blood tests. So probably it's our turn to explain them why it's needed because um, they should know the complications and everything associated with air transplant too. Any basic surgeries, any basic principles of any surgery is almost same. And that's what we need to do all the blood investigations because there will be potential blood loss will happen in air transplant too. Next. So FUT procedure goes under local anesthesia. Uh, if you can uh, remember ourselves this, uh, uh, giving our lidocaine uh, two percent will last for only ninety minutes. So how do you do this, this procedure for ten hours? That's a question which arises for any surgeon. So here there is a simple a combination of our local anesthesia. We have to make it one percent rather thirty two percent because we need large amount of uh, volume, almost sixty ml of local anesthesia. One percent we need it, so we cannot go with two percent. So we add uh, bupiacaine point five percent four ml. This combination will almost work for eight to ten hours surprisingly. So this is the armamentarium required for this FUT procedure is we need number 15 blades, adds some forceps and myos cutting scissors, nail holder and uh, number three, uh, number two and three are uh, vital for the inner clo closure or proline three for the uh, skin closure. Usually by bipolar diatomy sometimes we need it and few abdominal sponges also we need it for the procedure as a basic instrumentation. So the reasons to choose this patient FU, why FUT for this patient? Uh, there are a few things. Skin laxity was excellent. Skin laxity, if it is more, we can get a bigger graft, a wider graft. Thick donor density. And patient wanted more grafts in first session because he is not sure for second session. So graft survival rate is always high in FUT. He had his own his knowledge about this, so he always opted for this. There are a few, few more other reasons why we choose FUT. That's called a fast harvesting technique. And you know, expecting long follicles where FUE is not possible. So we can go again for FUT. So patient has few favorable points and even being a surgeon, I had my points to go with FUT for this patient. Again, this is a patient's uh, mere choice. Now this is a long um, 
if you if you can uh, see it's more than 8 mm i, I think you very uh, rare of the rare you get this much because usually it will vary from 3 mm to 6 mm 7 mm is almost 9 mm for this patients fue is not possible so only option is going for fut but how do you, how do we come to know this uh, lengthier long follicles we need to do few uh, graft harvestation as a patch test then we can decide because here the point is uh, when the graft is very long if you go with fue there's a more possibility of transaction and transaction is very high so we have to go with the fut in this case now the procedure just goes uh, after the strip harvestation done we close this uh, wound in two layers with the uh, trichophytic closure i would like to show this a video about all this uh, in next slide so trichophytic closure is a just kind of removing the uh, outer edge of the skin which uh, helps us inversion of the uh, closure inversion of the skin always uh, gives you bad scar so uh, keeping in that mind we should do a trichophytic closure and after the strip harvestation we have to send it for a slivering process a process where we separate the grafts uh, i'll show the video otherwise you may not understand this. and again we just send for the separation uh, of each graft it is very tedious and meticulous job done by at five to six technicians with magnification so after slivering we do separation process for the single single grafts we need to just remove excess fat and skin excess fat and skin we have to remove it otherwise it may cause little reaction to this and can cause the folliculitis also so during all these steps when the sliver separation of separation of grafts we have to keep in normal saline preserve it in normal saline temperature ranges from 4 degrees to 8 degrees this is most important step otherwise we may not get a, a good optimum growth even very less temperature also can damage the uh, grafts and even more temperature also can damage so 4 to 7 or 8 degrees in between is always ideal for our indian standards so we, we secure frontal anesthesia just like same anesthesia local anesthesia will give we say ring block or else field block we give around this scalp area so to make the recipient sites in a irregularly irregular manner that's most important again and the making the uh, slits in a regularly regular manner doesn't make any natural outcome so we have to make it in, in a fashion that irregularly irregular manner now again next step comes implantation during these steps we will take care of the depth and orientation of the grafts that we achieve natural look so we need to measure the uh, follicular uh, graft length accordingly we have to uh, make the slits and even the size of the grafts accordingly we, we need to select the blade like 1 mm 1.2 mm even 0.9 mm blade to make the slits the orientation of the grafts has to be very uh, very natural we have to follow the natural hair, hairs uh, natural existing hairs can, can guide us the angulations otherwise a transplantation looks very sad so we do tumor sense to that area to get tight further and raise the neurovascular bundles otherwise we may damage the uh, bundles there and nerves there so we need to raise it to reduce the bleeding while during the uh, transplantation and we do the tumor sense normal anesthesia mixed with the adrenaline so we implant these grafts by using forceps method which is fast and effective a lot a uh, lot many clinics or surgeons follow their own techniques some guys use the needle stick and place some guys use the implanters methods some guys make forceps implanters method some guys make recipient sites and blunt implanters uh, we follow routinely um, forceps implantation with pre made slits which can give me an excellent and fast uh, uh, fast uh, method so that survival rate is very high uh, we get uh, this follicular ureters singles doubles triples and quads too that depends on the patient donor quality Uh, we implant uh, single grafts in the hairline to achieve the natural look whereas we use other grafts in the mid scalp to get the density this patient almost got 3567 grafts to took almost 7 uh, to 7 and a half hours to finish the procedure so total time now i would like to play a video um, would help you with the basic details about the uh, fut procedure strip method is also uh, this fut is also called a strip method and this is the marking of the strip the width goes almost uh, anywhere from 30 cm to um, 31 cm some of the irrespective of the size of the scalp the uh, sorry i said width sorry length i was talking about length goes anywhere from 28 cm to 30 cm uh, somehow it's same for any patient because uh, the way you take a crescent shape to get the longer one width varies from anywhere from 1 cm to 1.2 1.3 1.5 even 1.9 sometime depending on the laxity this patient had a excellent skin laxity you can just check the uh, laxity test here 
both uh, vertical and horizontal we do now this is a something called uh, interesting about the taking the strip out this called very score blade this very score blade uh, help us to uh, accommodate two uh, blades one below and one above in between spacers these spacers can give us the idea about the uniform width of the strip each spacer is available in 2 mm 1 mm so that if i want uh, uh, 1 cm i need to go with five spacers of 2 mm spacers each like that we can accommodate so that you, you get a uniform uh, width of the uh, strip entire length so that healing would be excellent let us go with the procedure here now after local anesthesia i'm going to harvest the strip here we have to make sure that strip supposed to be located on the external occiput and not above that because above that we don't get the permanent air you may lose in future so once we get the indentations with the various score blade we use normal number 15 blade to um, raise the flap make sure that the flap incision should not go deep to the gallia because and you may damage the vessels and the, there's a possibility of uh, infection and even bleeding too if you get very deep so all the way we need epidermis dermis and a loose area tissue there we can secure the uh, best and the good strip without damaging vessels meticulously we need to raise the uh, strip at the level of uh, loose area tissue just above the gallia and uh, we should make sure that none of the follicular uh, units should be damaged while uh, raising the strip sometimes we can fastest uh, we can do in 10 minutes it will mean sometime it goes to 45 minutes to 1 hour and uh, it, it it varies to uh, person to person and even the bleeding also make uh, our our work little difficult so this is a almost taking 30 cm length of the uh, strip around 1.5 cm approximately so once the strip has been harvested we need to trim the edge this is called trichophytic closure and this helps us to get the undetectable scar the idea is to uh, the triangular wedge type when you cut it uh, our hair will go go grow through that uh, scar and which mimics like having no scar so this is called uh, trichophytic closure i mean a uh, common term now is just uh, uh, removing the edge skin both sides upper and lower flap you can observe that as a coming out of that that would help us to give the uh, minimum scar for us one layer in the layer close with vicryl two or three depending on the patient uh, skin toughness and, and upper layer goes with the proline three zero make sure that you should never use the two three four steps on the skin and would, would uh, lead to some kind of indentations and marks later on so you have to manage with your um, needle holder only so once we do this and this graft is sent for the uh, separation that is preserved in cold saline uh, cold normal saline ice made with cold normal saline that's ideal actually this is the graft that is strip we can strip we can say now this the strip sent for uh, something called slivering process uh, another important step we need to separate the uh, graft from the strip so this needs an uh, expertise uh, guys so uh, without damaging any follicles and we need to do sliver uh, very meticulously it is again a uh, tedious uh, job and we should make sure that all the slices are uh, very good and uh, go through the skin to the level and even follicles so while doing this no follicle should be damaged for experience uh, surgeon or technician to do the slivering can take uh, approximately 30 40 minutes this always should go with the magnification maybe 3x or more and even some guys does under the stereoscopic microscopes usually a 3x magnification will suffice our needs uh, this is the uh, last fiber from the strip and you can see this fibers uh, preserved in the cold saline and again this fiber sent for separation process now this is the fly well goes for the separation process we need to separate each and every uh, follicle here one important step is we have to just separate however it is existed in our uh, scalp suppose you got a uh, double follicle we need to make it double the triplet or quads we have to make it like that. we should not divide the family of the bunch of the air follicular unit it damages the follicle it doesn't grow that is the most important uh, uh, 
point to remember in this uh, thing because most of the uh, clinics they do follicular implantation it might not grow so these are the grafts we can say or follicular unit we can say so here uh, the technician is removing the uh, excess fat and the epidermis too while doing this operation meanwhile we, we need to keep suturing the patient who then we need to get it ready for him so that we need to save the time because this is the procedure which has a time constraint whoever can implant 600 of hours now can get an excellent results after 600 of 7 hours the growth rate goes very badly down so the time is a very important and crucial factor for a transplant the beginners can start with a small number of grafts because if you harvest more number you cannot implant it in the in the given time until they have trained the team and trained surgeons so that's how the follicular news looks for now it goes for counting after this uh, most of the patients will ask for the count uh, counting is always better to plan and even inform the patient and for us get the idea how many grafts we have to do after that we are going to mark the implanted area and we give the local anesthesia which is prepared already and tumescence is a must so that again raise the neurovascular bundles and once we do that we will measure the our follicular length and there are blades available around 0.9 mm 1 mm 1.1 mm depending on the skin type you have to choose it measure the length of the uh, follicular unit accordingly we need to make the slits in a sagittal plane while making the slits or recipient sites the angulation is supposed to be very acute somewhere around 15 degrees to 20 degrees to give you a very natural look if you make it uh, around 45 degrees and above it looks like an erection kind of thing and it doesn't give you the density most of the time when you do this uh, uh, 15 to 20 degrees angulation slates all the time your blade it will be inside the epidermis and dermis only so that implantation will be little difficult but however you get the excellent uh, outcome with that if this goes to very deep probably uh, the follicular uh, uh, units will not grow that's how it looks immediately after the uh, making the recipient sites accordingly the number available we have to make the slits so that it match exactly and now we going to implant with forceps and by using the forceps we use zero tendon forceps method the other four guys can uh, sit and do that's what it looks uh, before 10 days 13 days it looks like this all these grafts is going to shed after 13 days and if you can make a nice uh, uh, trichomatic closure you don't even see get to see any scar so it will be almost undetectable even if you shave it but we cannot promise to the patient uh, the same way because uh, each patient skin is different and so uh, the scars however even if you do the best thing you, you will get 10 to 15% guys will get the scar with that uh, with that perception most of the patients are now opting for fue so now that's what the fue i would like to go to uh, fue details and after this procedure the bandage is a must we secure implanted area with the bandage and remove the next day results will appear after 6 to 8 months and most of the time complete results will be seen after 10 to 12 months now what are the disadvantages and advantages of this fut advantages like quality of the grafts are excellent with the fut because when you see the fue you will understand why it is and easy to harvest for a surgeon and the follicular growth rate is very high and can we can cover the larger bald area and uh, there is a there's a uh, sometime option of doing fue in the same day that means a combination method patient can get extremely high grafts so there is advantages with the fut and whereas sometime fue is not not possible because of the tough skin where you can again think about fut these are the advantages and disadvantage just as simple as a pain and last for almost a week time and scar and most of the indian skins has a hypertrophic scar tendency and i think that's that's the reason most of the patients will afraid of going for the fut now we we'll go with fue and this i'm going to present a case with fue fue is nothing but follicular unit extraction where we don't use any cut and stitch method where we'll harvest single single follicles by using the small tiny punches a lot many names are given for fue neograft fusc graft and dht technique whatever it is this all the techniques are same a very little modification overall only a few t and a few e are there a lot of confusion for the youngsters but i think a few e the same technique most of the guys give the individual names according to their uh, uh, techniques 
So FU is almost same, only the variation is in the punch size and the machine, which one you're using it. So this patient is a male, is 28 years, class three type, uh, a little diffuse pattern. Uh, I'm sure he doesn't need more wraps. So suggested for him FUE and reasons, there are reasons like he needs less grafts and there is a possibility that he may lose more hair in case so that he can go for a shave too in future, he can shave completely shave his hair. Further reason, he opted for FUE. And patient also wants a little painless and comfortable procedure. Patient was worried about FUE scar. So these are the reasons for to go with him the FUE. Ornamentarium for FUE, little variation, there'll be little difference between this FUE and the FUE. Here we have a, a dental micromotor on straight hand piece. And the FUE punches, uh, according to the size of the graph, we can use 0.8 mm, 0.9 mm, 1 mm. For beard and chest, we, uh, we usually use uh, point, uh, uh, for beard, we use 0 0.8, 0 0.9, for the, uh, sometimes even 0.62. For chest, we use 0.9. For scalp, most of the time use 0.9 and 1 mm. There's a lot of variations with that. That goes with according to the surgeon size. And this is the result after uh, eight months. And you can observe the very natural uh, results in the uh, hairline. That's what the, the transplantation concept nowadays moved to a concept of not only having hair on the scalp, it's having no tension to it. In the sense, the transplantation results are not that great. And even patient, even their friends, everyone just look at it and ask you what is that. So, one should not even notice your transplant. That's what the beauty of the transplantation when we do. So this technique, again, uh, we need to trim the hair. A local anesthesia and tumor sense is almost same. Harvesting the grafts, unlike a FUT process, this will take um, almost two and a half, three hours to harvest 3,000 grafts. It's very tedious for a surgeon under the magnification 3X or 4X. So I would like to show you a video about the um, FUE. Just go ahead with this. So this is also called a follicular unit extraction because we, we extract one by one. So this is a few marking area. Here advantage is unlike FUT, we got a larger surface area to harvest more grafts. That's the advantage with the FUE and repeated sessions also we can do uh, without uh, damaging the backside uh, donor quality. So there is no linear scar. So that's what the follicular units appears. When we target it, we have to target such a way that the better graphs. This is the ornament used for the arrestation of the FUE. This may, these are the FUE punches with different companies give you different uh, shapes and stainless steel and whatever it is. And this is straight hand piece which used for dental purpose can be used for this. Arrestation process is uh, very tricky because you know uh, it is a blind procedure we can say. You can see the curvature of the graphs. And sometimes, you know, some guys has a uh, curly hair and the inside the root will be very curled one. We cannot guess how it is. And another problem is when you have a thick epidermis and dermis, and imagine uh, if you punch it uh, one or two mm, we are, we are not going to be able to harvest it. So we, we cannot punch to complete the six or seven mm throughout the graph longitudinally. It's a soft tissue. It can damage anywhere in the tissue. So whoever has a thin skin, I mean, very easy skin like this, so kind of elastic type of skin can go better for this FUE. A tough skin is always very difficult. So a transaction rate is always there. And usually two to 5% is acceptable with the FUE procedure. This is an organization of different, different patients. And there is no particular technique to harvest this FUE because it's all depending on one, if you harvest a few grafts, you'll understand the patient scenario. You can understand the patient uh, angulations of the graft or how it is located in the scalp. And that's what we will we'll come to know after doing few grafts. Then we have to modify our technique or pressure, whatever it is. This is a straight hand piece with the rotation of around 25,000 to 50,000. Usually 30,000 speed uh, sharp punch will be okay. There are a few cases uh, when transaction rate is very high, they use blunt punch. So that when you when you do the blunt with the blunt punch, the graft scoops in into the this, uh, punch so that it will not damage much. That's the idea. So I'll just forward this video is a lot. And oh yeah, again, uh, yeah, you eat grafts also. We need process processing the grafts. Processing the grafts is nothing but removing this uh, epidermis, uh, which causes a lot of. Uh, uh, reaction to the scalp after implantation that's the most important step and the tedious job too. So avoid the, to avoid the folliculitis or cobblestoning appearance after the transplantation, we need to make sure removing the 
uh, fat and the protein intake then the skin is the most important uh, step before that uh, we do this and again we preserve in the cold saline or sometime we can soak with the uh, prp and the prp is nothing but a platelet rich plasma uh, all these grafts we can preserve in prp too if you can take from left to right uh, the left one is a ft grafts i just wanted to go back and show you this. If you can take the uh, graphs, I will uh, show the difference between the follicular units. The left one, extreme left one is uh, FUT graphs. You can see the hair is a little longer here. For FUE, we shave it completely so that you don't, you don't see any hair longer here. This is the FUE graph, second one. The last uh, three plus two, fire is a beard graphs. If you can notice it, all beard graphs has only single follicles and thicker one. Whereas scalp has sometimes two, three, four, even five, seven. Even sometimes Indian standard, we have seven to so on, on average in instant we have usually one two one two or two three two three kind of stuff so we can on average you can take a 2.6 follicles on average for indian standard scalp uh, grafts so 2.6 follicles per graft on average we can consider so now this is the implantation done by forceps after making the pre states that what i shown in fu to method we need to implant one by one by holding it in such a way that we shouldn't damage the follicles. And there is already pre-made slits and we need to implant it in that. And while implanting, we should not fold the grafts. We should implant it and pull it out so that it settle very neatly. So this is just immediately after implantation. While implanting, we have to keep spraying normal saline to avoid the dehydration of the grafts. The second day, post-operative, how it looks from the backside. Any scars that is found by FU, we can be healed within three to five days. Hardly takes seven days to look just like normal. This is 13th day post operative. AFUE 3000 graphs have been harvested, almost looks normal. So, this is the basic advantage for most of the patients looking for FUE nowadays because they can get back to the work immediately. A immediate day, in the sense, second day itself, they can almost uh, go to their work. This is just 13 days how it looks. And this is a different uh, Western skin FUE post of 13th day. You can observe like pinkish darts and reddish coloration because of their skin color. For Indians, it doesn't look like that. However, by end of 13th, 14th day, it looks very much normal. One year or one month, even one month later, you hardly can observe any uh, scars. But when you shave it completely, few patients, they can see a dotted kind of scars. And it's very negligible. So that is the reason while we are harvesting, we have to harvest such a way that very uniform way, even if we shave it, that shouldn't look like a patchy kind of uh, FUE. Even FUE, uh, bad harvestation can lead to very, very much bad scars. I've come across many such cases. So uniform harvestation is always recommended. This is a beard harvestation to a Western guy. Uh, this is a punch is you can notice it's uh, 0.6 mm it's more meticulous and, and then uh, more precision you need it and and the beard if the beard is good enough we can harvest almost 1500 grafts in single session and um, so uh, here in the beard uh, i don't think we need much tumescence necessary because the skin is very loose no need to inject the normal saline with that into the vital areas and all it may use a lot of huge swelling so Without a tumor sense, we can just go with a local anesthesia and, and our field block, we can go ahead with that. The beard is strong enough, we can almost do uh, 1,500 grafts very easily. So most of the time, below the neck, we do that because so that it doesn't appear uh, scars. Um, uh, the, usually the facial scars are very less. This is a chest uh, harvestation. We can use 0.8 or 0.9 mm. But surprisingly, again, chest has doubles and triples too. Uh, only problem with the chest is getting securing anesthesia for the larger area is very difficult. Even however you give a local anesthesia, you they still get the pain. I'm still scrambling for uh, striving for excellence to take help from someone else how to get the anesthesia and it not succeed with that. That's the reason we cannot harvest more wraps in a single day. We can do hardly 600 to 1000 in a day. So that, that's a problem. I don't think we can do this procedure under general anesthesia because the position changes every time. So this is a beard a chest harvestation. Yes. Uh, now all these graphs we have to preserve in cold saline. 
passing graphs graphs are so in pair is most important which can i observed it graphs which are so in pair for some time it gives us a more growth rate uh, this prp added with uh, a lot of micronutrients i think that is a reason uh, which can enhance the growth rate and even the you know, longevity of the graphs so preparation for implant is just like our ft it goes there is no change with that and post operative ft scars will heal in 3 to 5 days and all implant abuse will shed in 15 to 20 days whether a ft or ft results will show up in 6 to 8 months and the pros and cons of this fue or fue though it is painless and scarless multiple sessions can be performed in fue that's are advantage unlike ft but a ft we can only go one time second scar unlikely so beard and chest graft when we want to think about fue is a best option because we can do a ft in the beard on the beard and chest so that's what the advantage of the fue and it's very tedious because uh, you going to break your neck and back and eyesight i also because you want you work under magnification and the uh, powerful led lights can make your eyes too sick transaction rate is very high and difficult and tough for skins suppose if you get a long uh, you are talking about the long grafts lengthy grafts very difficult to harvest in such patients quality of the grafts may not match with the quality of the ft grafts because when you take the complete strip out you are going to section under direct vision you may have all three and four in the single graft But the FU is a blind procedure. When you harvest, try to harvest a triplet, you may get only single graft into the hand. Obviously, the average number of the hair per given under the grafts for FUT and FU always FUT is high. That's the difference. This is the long graft we're trying to show you. It's very rare. Out of 500 cases, we get one. So for such such patients, we need to do a patch test and go ahead with the further procedure. so there's a there's a few e patient just wanted to show you how it looks from day 1 to 5 months however the results will appear after 8 months but just go through the video how it looks uh, day 1 to day 5 which can help us to get some clarity about this few e And this is the patient uh, approached me at uh, class six or early class seven baldness, having an average donor. And this kind of cases, we need to advise them very well that they may need second session. And as Dr. David Sir and Dr. David Coombs were talking about unhappy patients, there are there everywhere. So for air transplant surgery, and not only air transplant surgery, any cosmetic surgery, the patient has to be matured enough to understand what we are doing. So that's most important. That has to filter in the consultation itself. Planning is most important. I was talking about the marking for the patient. If you can mark one centimeter down, that accounts. Imagine you are targeting three thousand grafts for this patient. If you mark the one centimeter down, that that attracts five fifty grafts extra, which accounts eighteen to twenty percent of the three thousand grafts. Imagine that much density is going to get less. So marking the proper area and very important. Most of the air transplant surgeons. failure starts from marking itself so that's the point we need to trace out and mark it so that we can get an excellent uh, results this is just 45 days it looks almost same almost same so two months all the grafts have been shed and looks like a bald patch so 80 days little the graft will show up little dark coloration of the scalp will start This is just five months, and I had to grow complete uh, results after uh, eight months, nine months. I am planning for him second session too. However, he is happy as of now, but I am sure he needs second session later on because few more um, gaps are there. So that's what it is after five months. These are more than three thousand final drafts implanted in one session.
thanks for watching this uh, uh, videos and all uh, my presentation thanks for this giving me opportunity and moral of the story of triathlon stunt is it's a, a very tedious job and we need to have a passion and more than uh, how many cases we reject is the most important to put in a right practice because a lot of youngsters will always want it the uh, triathlon stunt done whereas you need to choose which patient can get the results that's what any so any cosmetic surgery i think it is same thanks for giving me this opportunity thank you dr sridhar reddy it was indeed a very big presentation and very nice you covered the entire hair transplant surgery um and uh, and uh, uh, very nice results uh, the question to you is uh, do you, what are the post operative medications and how long do you continue uh well uh, routine routine antibiotic uh, taxim 500 uh, 200 oral tablet goes for 5 days bd uh, i don't think so we need but somehow i i'll just give them 5 days bd and uh, painkiller or anti inflammatory goes uh, just 3 days and that is uh, twice in a bd and if it is fut we'll give them a uh, flexon kind of tablet for 3 days fue just only two times in a day for only uh, two days is enough so i do give them uh, visalone 10 mg two two days to reduce the periarbital swelling otherwise nothing much no medication no ointment no cream i would give them okay and uh, uh, how is the success rate in vertex area well uh, vertex area success rate most of the people tell me that's a failure don't get it done that's not true the reason why vertex area always a failure is the problem is when you do the frontal implantation when you see the patient there is something called parallax error the light sunlight will not fall on him directly the way you look at it is a kind of angle tangential angle you see the hair first in the vertex area something different light falls straight away in the scalp in the way you look at it is different so that's the reason I always gives you illusion that you got a less density there and most of the uh, doctors what they do they implant straight we need to follow the wall that where the vertex area you got it so that is the reason vertex area always need more grafts than compared to the front so most of the time we give importance to the frontal area so assumption is fine you don't get results in the vertex area i do, I, i do get uh, good results with the uh, second session and i think it's possible thank you now uh, the question is open for all the three panelists there's only three sure. questions left and sure. no, no problem yes uh first uh this out of the out of the topic uh, dr dal um it's a small question from my side um in in rhinoplasties uh do you see any difference in your treatment plan uh, on english people do they have a specific kind of uh, uh nose or it is the same like a european bifid tips uh long columella I mean a lot a lot of patients that I see their main issue is actually the hump on the nose but broad nasal tips most english patients want their tip to be more defined so as you say they may have a bifid tip um i mean i david's cases were incredible that he showed they're really really good um he would do well in the uk with his nasal tip work which is what a lot of patients in the uk want one thing that we don't use so much in the uk um is alloplastic implants we tend to use um the patient's own septal cartilage or actually ribs and when i do use rib um which is quite rare actually but mainly on ethnic patients say for a uh, southeast asian nose i i use diced rib and i think a lot of my colleagues who do rhinoplasty do that but in the uk really i think it's it's nasal tip work in the hang columella i tend to do a lot of tongue and groove procedures and refining the nasal tip which as i'm sure david will tell you is a real waiting game you have to sit around and wait for the swelling to go down and hold the patient's hand and it's quite stressful actually thank you uh dr david sir there's two questions for you what is your opinion regarding a long term follow up with rib grafts sir you have to unmute unmute yourself yes sir can we now yeah yeah um i have had uh, bad experiences with the uh, costal cartilage grafts as well 
because it depends on, on, on the graph that you harvest. Uh, very many times if you harvest the floating rib, uh, it has a very bad curvature. And uh, the, the, the direction in which you put that graft is very important because you get sort of buckling uh, of the cartilage if you put the lower uh, cartilage, particularly for dorsal augmentation. In those situations, even if you put it, uh, uh, the concavity or the convexity facing up or down, then you still get some sort of a deviation to one side or buckling because uh, that particular curvature of the rib has a certain memory. So what I do is a harvest, uh, uh, a cartilage graph from the higher level, that is the, the, the face for six. So you have a thick, wide graph and use the core of the graph to get the maximum length and eliminate the side, the curvature of the rib. And that gives much more stability than using the, the sides of the rib. So it depends on the, the direction in which you uh, implant it, uh, when you keep it flat or uh, the medial, the lateral side facing the superior or inferior end. So. Uh, the long-term results are good if you use that very carefully. In the beginning, I've had uh, buckling of graphs, but uh, over time, you realize that you know you need to secure them well, you need to put the right part of the cartilage in the right place. Otherwise, you definitely. Otherwise, I think uh, the cartilage graft is pretty good. Um, the last question. Uh, so, what precautions or management do you use for tissue discoloration complications or tissue necrosis? Well, um, in one or two patients where I had uh, areas of necrosis, uh, the only thing you can do is good ministration to, to uh, use certain uh, uh, components called U-graft or sometimes use PRP and things like that. Applications of uh, U-graft can be done by the patient uh, that is available. And uh, it kind of resurfaces well. It actually is as, as a disaster when you have necrosis. Discoloration, I have not had uh, any with my patients. The one that I showed was a patient who came to me and I'm, I was not sure why you get sort of discolorations like that unless you have sort of bad achymosis because the result in some sort of patchy discoloration. And I have no answer to that. Okay, sir. Uh, Dr. Darrell, um, what are the suture materials know. you use? I don't know if Dr. Darrell can answer that question. <laughs> on, on no, there's another question. <laughs> because achymosis is common probably with the ferrous skin. It yeah. is, yeah. I mean, the, th the thing is, is not to cause complication in the first place. You have to be really careful with the thickness of the flap in the nose. I mean, it's very tempting on someone who has thick, sebaceous skin of the nose to yes. thin the skin down. But once you get that complication, particularly in Caucasian fair skin patients, you're running into trouble. Um, one of my registrars thinned the skin on a post-traumatic nasal deformity once, and the hospital I worked in was successfully sued. Um, it's very, very difficult, even trying to use filler to mark, trying to disguise divots, all these things. It's just very, very difficult, very difficult. I think uh, even the compression uh, plays a very important role in necrosis because I had one patient uh, from another clinic came with a tip necrosis, very hairy dorsal graft. The, the, the skin was much pulled and it, it sutured. Oh, yeah. There's a tip necrosis. So yeah. even the compression plays a really important role. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Darrell, there's one question for you. Uh, what are the suture material of your choice when you do a neck lift uh, by layers? So, which layer you prefer? What kind of sutures? Okay, well, if I'm repairing, for instance, say if we start from deep to surface layer, um, if I'm um, applicating the anterior bellies of digastric, which is not that common, I will use uh, 4 0 or 3 0 PDS. Um, for the um, anterior, well, the medial margins of the platysma muscle. I sometimes used um, Ethylon actually, but again, I've gone back to using 5 or 4 PDS for that. And then for the subcutaneous tissues, just Vicryl, Vicryl Rapide. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sridhar Reddy, last question to yes. you. What, yes. what about your post-operative aminoxidil and other hair supplements for the growth? Uh, well, uh, minoxidil and finasteride is a uh, kind of medicine that has a good role, it play a good role in uh, hair growth. I, I don't think this uh, transplanted hair requires it. In the sense, someone has diffuse pattern hair loss. For them, if you consider transplantation, we can give them three and a half months to four months multivitamins and uh, finasteride, weekly twice, one, in, one milligram. Whereas minoxidil should go for at least seven months. Later on, may not be necessary. 
someone who is already completely bald and hair fall is stabilized there is no no need of giving any medication other than uh, multivitamins that much thank you so much uh, um, for all the panelists and indeed it was a fantastic session uh, i uh, give a big thanks um, uh, to the organizing team uh, and uh, president uh, dr reena madam for giving me a, such a big opportunity as a moderator uh, for this aesthetic surgery session Thank you so much. Sorry, can Thank I interrupt? One question, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah, please. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Professor Taro, that was an excellent presentation. Especially the Thank way you. you recorded the cases was fantastic. So Thank I you. just want to know, like, when when a patient requests both Lefont one and rhinoplasty, do you, will mm. you do them together, or you will wait for the rhinoplasty? Well, actually, I had a, I had a small piece of a presentation in the same one. where i thought i will include uh, rhinoplasty as an adjunct in in orthognathic surgery orthognathic, okay and then i thought it would be too much to cover so i just okay. sort of deleted that part of the lecture but uh, very interesting thing uh, what i do i i, I think i spoke uh, in the chennai conference about this uh, addressing the nose uh, uh, in in orthognathic surgery uh, when you do a lefo one you yes. can to a large extent control the changes in the nose now there are five things that you can do to control the nose the changes in the nose if you are doing an intrusion or uh, lowering of the maxilla or an advancement you need to do a few things one is uh, take care of the septum two the anterior nasal spine three uh, the piriform plasty four you do a, a, a cinching suture um five reduction of the septum now you need to tailor these things accordingly depending on the uh, type of the lepo one that you're going to do uh, if i'm lowering if you're lowering the maxilla for example and you're grafting it uh, uh, in a lowering situation you essentially don't need to do anything with the septum and nor the piriform to an extent if it is just the lowering um, if you're intruding the maxilla then what you need to do not overtly trim the septum Uh, i'm sorry the 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 anterior nasal spine you need to trim the septum a wee bit uh, make a sort of a tongue in groove and accommodate the septum make sure that you when you put it back it sort of doesn't lift the nose uh retain the spine to the end and decide on how much you're going to trim because if if you don't trim it you might end up with a little sort of a saddling and the piriform base is really need to be uh, rounded off and trimmed to the superior edge so you can actually control the nose to a large extent and actually avoid a rhinoplasty post operatively and i don't think you should do any sort of a rhinoplasty at the primary instance where you're doing the lefo one so in fact you can control the nose uh, during lefo one itself okay yeah thank you yes sir thank you you can take over yes. i think uh, it is um, it's over i give it to dr jimson sir to conclude thank you thank you sai uh, for the wonderful moderation and uh, yes uh, indeed uh, the panelists have uh, given a different uh, idea about what a maxillofacial surgeon can do uh, you i mean from the conventional trauma cases to the orthognathics to your cancer and all those things uh, it is indeed a uh, kind of uh, super speciality where <laughs> within our speciality so you have you, you you have indeed open up eyes to the youngsters and even to the experienced practitioners as well and hat hat transplant uh, i mean we have seen some cases uh, by sai uh, done by sai and uh, indeed an eye opener for us uh, dr sridhar so that's a fantastic fantastic presentation from the masters themselves and and uh, we had almost 250 participants right from the beginning uh, till say few minutes back so it was wonderful wonderfully uh, uh, accepted and uh, uh, presentations by everyone thank you all for your time and uh, dr daryl dr david and dr sridhar and not to forget our own sainath for having coordinated and done fantastic work and dr suresh 
you always been with us uh, in coordinating uh, things and then i would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, dr elamenil who was instrumental in getting this team together and uh, coordinating and getting things done thank you dr elamenil she is not able to join uh, today with us and then uh, to our president dr reena john has always been very supportive uh, for the programs and we have had many many senior uh, colleagues from all over the world including dr paul sambrook from down under from australia uh, from uh, various other countries and uh, dr uh, i mean senior consultants from india as well and all the post graduates uh, and last but not the least thank you to striker who has been uh, a backbone to all our programs over the past few months and uh, thank you to all the participants in next week we are going to have a quiz program for the post graduates which indeed is going to be another wonderful session and the last week on the 29th we are going to have a, a triple o, o symposium on cis uh, of the oral cavity again consultants from the uk and from our india are going to participate in that as a as panelists and speakers looking forward to your participation uh, in the coming weeks as well and thank you on behalf of our oral maxillary surgeons of india tamil nadu and puducherry branch see you all next week thank you thank you very much thank you, thank you very much sir thank you sir thank you sridhar thank you sir and i don't dare i won't disturb you anymore <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> I've missed you. Anyway, uh, I know you're on a pretty uh, tight schedule of your waiting list. Yeah, but thank you very much for the invite. It's a real honour, and I really enjoyed it. And I hope it was really useful. And I learned a lot as well today. So thank you. It's very educational. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Coombs. Thank you.